about like the eco oh you know like we we want to be on this device like well here's a way to be on the device no but we meant your highly protected store which you know vets everything that goes through there we went through there too you know it's like well eh, you know it's about yeah. the device build a web app you know yeah um and it was interesting to hear them say that um uh that they had worked with uh uh with the safari team to actually like make sure that stuff all worked yeah that's cool yeah i didn't read that that's interesting yeah i think mm-hmm. I have, yeah i have a buddy who's like super big into pwas you know and not to be confused with waps um <laughs> and uh he he's been you know oh i'm like i don't know i mean like i just you know i'm like why is anybody using it and i think it just might be because the app store is so convenient but so what makes or maybe should we should we save this for the show i don't know because i I know what a web app is. I understand. Or I, I feel like I understand a web app, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's an application via a web page. Is a progressive web app different than that? Yeah. A, yeah. A, a, basically, a basically, what it what does, does is, is, is in, in, you, get you get a larger, larger uh, uh, you know, you, you, know, you get, get you get a get larger, larger sort of amount, amount of like memory allocation, allocation and stuff. stuff. Oh, okay. You know. You know. So, so it's, it's, it's you know, a framework, you know, framework. So it's still, it's still like, like JavaScript, JavaScript and stuff, but the idea, idea is that basically, basically you're, you're, you have a large have amount of memory to play with stuff, you know, and, you know, be able to do things. Cool. Oh, sorry about that, everybody. We got that echo figured out. Uh, well, that's that's interesting. I uh, so yeah, I'm I'm interested. They've also got the um, the uh, Wi-Fi controller, like the Stadia, so it doesn't hook up to a device. It just hook, you know, connects to your router as a means of hmm. cutting out input smart lag. yeah um and i think I, I part one of the details that i wasn't sh- super sure about is um because they've got the luna plus um channel which is six dollars a month and that's like a game pass thing where you get a hundred or some games that you just get to play as long as you pay that monthly price um yeah I wonder, are they doing any? Because that's the thing that I really don't. Um, I don't that like kind of was the downfall a little bit for Stadia was the heavy, heavy reliance on a la carte pricing for games. Like, just buy all your games mm-hmm. at sixty dollars, and you'll be kind of in this platform. And then they also have the Game Pass type, type subscription for Stadia, but it doesn't have a lot of good games. It really they've never. That they're not in that in that deal making business, and so they don't have a lot of good deals on that. Yeah, and, and I Stadia was a thing that I said uh, that's going to be the test of how much goodwill has Google lost by abandoning projects, you know. And and that was I thought that that the biggest make or break for Stadia was going to be how eager will developers be to work with Google on this, given. Google's abandoned so much stuff in the past and Stadium might be where that bill kind of comes due. And I think that's sort of been kind of the case where people are like, we've got other better options out there that we know are going to be in it longer. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. And I, hi, Justin. Hello. Hello, 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 everybody. We are getting set up here for weird things. Uh, why did it shrink you, Andrew? Why did it do that? Shouldn't have done that. Help me. Okay, there, oh, and there's Justin. Double, Double Justin. Justin. Double Justin and zero Andrew. Weird. Ah! Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Oh. Oh, why is it doing that? <laughs> Better. <laughs> Perfect. 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 Leave it. Don't miss it. it. Nailed, Nailed it. it. Uh, okay, we got that echo. We got the echo down. We got the echo. Thank you, everybody, for reminding me of the echo. Um, <laughs> oh, Bryce, there's echo. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Thank you for that, Andrew. Okay, so we may just have to. Uh, so I, I, I am still giving board audio. I can I can go to not board audio if it doesn't uh, clear out. No, you're yeah, fine. Justin. You're good. I don't know what any of that meant, but I'm going to blame somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. You're good. Let's see. What if we did? So, Justin, um, I should have been taking all my tax questions to Twitter, right? Because we got so many experts out there now. And I'll tell you what. Uh, I mean, 
when everybody was making fun of uh, taking uh, haircuts as a tax deduction, I was like, wait, that's a bad thing? Because <laughs> <laughs> no, spoiler alert, I've been taking these haircuts for years. Yeah, when you're on camera, do stuff like that. There's a difference, you know. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. The, the president. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I feel like that should be the official weird things uh, uh, position on yeah. on that story. I created a Andrew's. Ah! Andrew's I created Andrew's uh, foot YouTube foot channel just so I can deduct my pedicures. You know. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Drop that link, player. Exactly. It's my most popular tra- he channel. He does customs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know a friend of mine's like wife was telling me about how she does like videos like oh yeah like I do videos where people like I stomp on balloons and stuff she's like Not, nothing sexual I'm like maybe not on your end but, not for you, but like, yeah. I was just like I'm like man like <laughs> so there is a genre of, uh, of of video that is well paid for for uh, young professional wrestlers where it's just young professional wrestlers that will wrestle matches with each other that just happen to have like very long rest holds where like they're just kind of rubbing up against each other for a while. Like uh, no nudity, no outward sexual, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, activity. It's just kind of like professional wrestling that just happens to have a lot of body contact. Like it's just a match with a lot of body contact. And there are the, the, the headliners of our like current crop of professional wrestling all have these videos that still circulate around on the internet because they were once young and hungry and these videos pay a lot of money. And, uh, you know, again, it's not porn. It's just, you know, Weird. a really slow, mm-hmm. methodical match. It sounds like Can MMA. We... It, it actually, do you, you watch some of those UFC fights? And that, I mean, that's, you're describing that show to UFC a is, yeah. <laughs> UFC is, is, is a whole nother, like, you know, that's, it's one of those things where it's like, I like it when, when UFC is like very like stand up boxing, but also somebody might get kicked in the head. I'm not exactly a like, Greco-Roman wrestling aficionado, so I can understand where some people are like, "No, you don't understand the beauty of of exactly the the, the float over there." But I was like, eh, "I don't know. It just kind of looks like humping." <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, just I can't. Uh, is the the chat stuff looks like Greek to text to me? Um, I don't know if there's anything we can do or not. But I saw what I thought was my name there, and, and maybe was my mom insulting me. So maybe it's better I don't see. But um, a big babby said, Andrew yeah. Maine, I will cut your hair for forty thousand dollars. That's a discount off the rate I offered Justin. Yes, um, he I offered hate. me a seventy thousand dollar haircut. So you're uh, getting a yeah. real bargain. I cut here. my own hair. Cut my own hair now. Uh, yeah. I can make this a I can, forty thousand dollars. Yeah, I can make this a little bigger. I think. I think. Oh, that looks about right. Yeah, I forgot that when I made these graphics. Ooh, look at that. I ended up having there to scale them up at, after I plugged them all in. Game Boy lettering now. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> this is going to be the best that we got. It's good. No, no, it works. Okay, good. All right. Well, I am recording over there. I'm going to sync my recording here that's a three two channels 44 one a three a three a three sweet hey you guys you guys want to do you want to do some weird things yeah Yeah. really long holds (laughs) all right well then uh i'm going to count you in andrew in three two Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello! Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello! And that's it! That's, that's it. all we got. This is the normal yeah, cast big, of crew. Uh, big uh, uh, get well soon to Brian and uh, Bonnie. They announced last week that they have unfortunately <laughs> they, they, they got COVID while trying to get a dog. 
Mm. So uh, uh, we will we will hear from Brian soon. But everybody, go wish him well at Schwood on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get the details about that. We'll get to the real details about this new modern rogue video that they're probably working on. Yeah. Called Let's Get COVID. Uh, so um, kind of some cool news came out today. That is water on Mars. We've heard about this before, but some, some researchers said they've got proof. Last year, there was a uh, paper that came out that said, hey, we think we found evidence of a lake underneath the ice cap on Mars. And this is a new paper that says, yes, we think we've got more confirmation of this. Actually, there might be like three lakes. Uh, some of them as many as like, I got to pull up the, uh, the data here, but I think like 30 to 50 kilometers across. So, I mean, that's pretty interesting. It's not confirmed. There are other people say, we're not sure if we, we read into the data the same way, but it looks like there is a growing body of evidence that there might be bodies of water, not just ice, but actual liquid bodies of water underneath the ice and maybe other places on Mars. So, wow. so this is really the like the, the biggest factor here is the idea of of colonization, right? Or or some kind of permanent settlement because we it would be easier if there is a natural water source. We can a in, infer that there is uh, uh, the ability to not have to synthesize it there, right? That's a uh, yes. That's absolutely part of the impact. Is the idea that. The more water there is on Mars, the better our chances of being able to build, you know, a civilization on Mars because water, as you know, is kind of critical. But also it brings up the possibility that could there still be life on Mars? Now, the problem with this water is that the salinity, we estimate, the brininess is extremely high, higher than anything on Earth where we've ever found life. We have places in Antarctica, we've had pools of water, but it's so salty that nothing lives there as far as we know. And that could be the same case here, which if there's no life, it makes it probably an easier case for colonizing. If we find that there's life there, then it's sort of like, hey, do we want to be, you know, how much impact do we want to have on this environment? But, you know, the chances of there being life there is probably not terribly high. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, again, that, that is always one of the fascinating ideas is that we'll, we'll uh, uh, progress to the point where we are indeed a multi-planet species and we're able to get there and we're like, oh, wait, also, let's figure out what we're going to do with all this life here now. Whoopsie. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, I don't think that will be an inconsequential, if there was that, I think that's the, the best case for, you want, life would show you that it's possible for life to exist. But yeah. or, or, you know, to colonize life as we try to be more uh, proactive about being concerned about our environment, you know, that creates another situation where if, let's say we found a wonderful underneath cavern, you know, cavern underneath the soil of Mars, but there was life in there, we might be hesitant to sort of want to live in there because we might say, oh, you know, do we want to do that? So, you know, it's it, these are yeah, these will be real issues. The there was a new Mars pro, probe or a, a rover that went up very recently, right? Uh, is is that right, Andrew? Uh, there's gonna be yeah, we have a rover that we've sent up that there's like the Mars 2020, and and I just I just want to address some some of the comments says oh yeah like Europeans were worried about all the pre-existing life when they landed in America. It's true they didn't, but we're not them. You know we we were sending when the people who were doing space exploration, NASA and space agents and stuff worry considerably about this. You know, we've we've withheld rocket launches because of the wildlife impact on semi-threatened species. We've said, no, we are extremely cautionary now, not to say that we always will be, and that will be the norm, but I would say that uh, we use an abundance of caution because we look back at the past and go, oh, what impact did we have here? And and we don't want to repeat those. You know, there, there are more people like you going, well, what about this than there were back then? You know, there weren't yeah. a lot of people worried about, you know, it's like, that's not a novel thought now. Everybody's thinking this, like, well, morally, we made some bad choices in the past, perhaps, you know, what do we do going forward? Hmm. Uh, but, my, my question about the rover is, are, the, are these machines that are going up, are they equipped to check for life? Are they equipped to look for water? Do, do we know that? Yes. They have different tools that are designed to sort of look like look for life. Like the new rover we have actually has a drill that will drill into the surface and will actually be able to go deeper than we have before. We're using new kinds of, you know, radar and et cetera to sort of try to penetrate that. So we've increased the tools that go on the rovers to be able to look for life, you know, and it, if it's 
miles beneath or it's deep in caverns, we're likely to find evidence of that. But if we are able to find stuff in the surface and signs of stuff, you know, you might be looking for gas traces, things like that, that could give you an indication there could be something going on there. Okay. Um, what if, so let's say we do find through a mix of like rovers and samples and testing that, that you can generate water on Mars or that there is a mechanism through which water can be generated on Mars. What does that, what does that mean broadly speaking for, I don't know, human, human trips out there? So it depends if we go into one of the things they'll do is they'll take a sample. You get like a dirt sample and they put it into uh, a, 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 basically an oven and they heat it up and you see what comes out of it. And if you find that we're able to go towards areas that maybe have high moisture content or have presence of water in there, it gives you an idea of how much water would be available. And that can give you an idea of how much energy it would take because in order to extract water from the soil, you would need to have, you know, apply energy to it to be able to do that. So right now we could probably get sort of a, uh, a thumbnail sketch idea of what that might entail. But later missions and SpaceX is, you know, looking into this considerably because if they're going to be refueling the rockets on Mars, you know, they need to be able to, you know, produce methane. And in order to do that, you're going to need to be able to have, you know, access to water because of the hydrogen and oxygen. And so uh, we'll see what happens from, you know, what's going to be launched later on. Like at some point, there probably probably be some joint missions, probably ideally with them and NASA to send some more sophisticated landers and stuff designed to see what you can do. Hmm. Uh, is, uh, do we know where, I, I assume we know where we, where about we are going to land these landers. Uh, mm -hmm. are they close to where we would suspect that these ice caps are or, or, or the lakes? Like, is this something where, uh, this is like part of the plan? I, I presume that like pretty much the entire life cycle of this lander is already planned out. Yeah, they're, they're not going to be, as far as I understand, anywhere near uh, where, let's say, the ice caps are. and But they're going to be in regions that look like they're pretty interesting to that. And so uh, I'm looking here at the 2020 landing site, uh, Jezero Crater. So um, if you go to NASA has a website, you can go see where they have uh, the landing site selection. And they show you where the finalists were. And they're all kind of in the, in the middle latitudes. Uh, from where they could go from. So basically, you know, that was settled on that. So I think that was like, yeah, Jezero. So those are going to be towards the middle there. But those are places where they look for what's going to be the most interesting. And, you know, there's a whole list of science criteria. Uh, and so, for instance, criteria number one is the site is astrobiologically relevant, ancient environment, and has geological diversity that has potential to yield fundamental scientific discoveries. Idea, basically, they were looking for places like if there was evidence of life, would you find this there? And it, could it be things that may be ocean beds, et cetera, things like that. Criterion two, a rigorously documented and returnable cache of rocks and regular samples that are near there. So can they get rocks and things like this uh, for you know a return mission? Um, and then three, and uh, there, there's a high comp assumptions evidence in any interpretive models to support the assessments or criteria at one and two. So criteria three is like one and two, it's kind of weird very corporate speak um <laughs> you have to see if there's so anyhow, synergy it comes, if there's any yeah. if there's any collaboration sparks and so criterion five is the site has a high potential for significant water resources that may be of use for future exploration whether in the form of water rich hydrated minerals ice or ice regolith or subsurface ice so that's saying like that's another criterion that weighs into it. first thing they want is like we want cool looking rocks you know we want we want cool looking rocks if we find a place like that and plus, 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 we're able to find it near there within a the distance of where the rover can go, we can also find things that look like there might be water or ice rather uh, then yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I'll tell you what, I, I think that that is a good thing to look forward to. And you can look forward to more and more weird things content when you support patreon.com slash Weird things. Keep this uh, show a rolling. Uh, uh, head on over there right now, patreon.com slash weird things, and get your custom RSS feed. That way, you just enter it in one time into the podcatcher of your choice. You don't have to sign in. 
Uh, you just get the After Things podcast uh, sooner than anybody. Well, you get the After Things podcast full stop, and you get this episode probably sooner than uh, uh, you would otherwise. So head on over there right now, patreon.com slash weird things. So there's an interesting study that came out, and it talks about the they did a comprehensive survey of the cognitive and physical functions of elderly people and compared them to how people scored in the past. And mm -hmm. so my question is that how would you say a cohort of, let's say, 70-year-olds scored today versus people from uh, 1980s, 1940s, et cetera? 70-year-olds 70, 70 so from those periods? 75 to 80. We'll put 75 to 80. Yeah. Okay, but, but yeah. not the so same I, people. I gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. No, no, no. Yeah. I would presume that they would score better that that now as life expectancy although we are that's that's pretty much topping out at, at life expectancy right life expectancy is around 85 86 something like that so 75 to 80 you know you are you are you're, you're coming up on what we what we know as as the average there so i would say you know uh, i i say better they're sharper now than they were in the past I I feel like I would say the opposite only because I think we, well, I don't know, we have so much more information at our fingertips. I feel like we tend to offload more information because it's so easy to say search for it. But then again, like the seven, I would say maybe the 70 year old cohort today is still not super technically, uh, you know, tech tech involved. Um, but I would say a few, maybe if not today, a future trend might be to trend down because we are so willing to offload information. Oh, Bryce, you and you, this is the, the whole original sin. Every, every generation believes that the thing that they did made them worse than the generation before. All those people are like, well, yeah, everything was great before the radio came in and everything <laughs> was, was amazing before the television rotted our brains and everything was great before yeah, was the internet. Yeah. You know, those Nazi era teens, like, yeah, everything's great before rampant anti cinemacism you know, geez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Justin's like, ah, every generation says that. Every generation uh, yeah. they have their own thing. So, all right. Yeah, every once in a while, the Nazis prove you're right. But, like, uh, in general, the trend is that this stuff is, is things that we can survive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... They went and they did a comparison. They said among men and women between the ages of 75 and 80, muscle strength, walking speed, reaction speed, verbal fluency, reasoning, and working memory are nowadays significantly better than they were in people at the same age born earlier. In lung function, same. No change in lung function. But across the board, they find that, yeah, no, old people are getting younger. And I would say part of that is the idea our fundamental concept of exercise from at every level has kind of really, really, really changed from the like fifties and sixties. Like the idea of everybody should get up and walk and everybody should do a thing and everybody should be a little bit more active, uh, I think is, is fundamentally more pervasive. So I, it, it does not shock me to see that as people get older, they, you know, they're the, these old vessels are just in a little bit better shape. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah, like exercising, more, like you keep stretching life expectancy out, you're going to see less fragility as, as people age. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the way yeah, Fibble says less smoking, although I don't know if we're if, if, if you're really going to see that necessarily with with the people that are 75 and 80 now. I mean, they they mm. all lived through pretty heavy smoking, you know, a, a publicly available smoking areas. Uh, although uh, certainly for, for, you know, people my age, even it's like, I remember a kid, I remember as a kid, there being a smoking section on airplanes and then that like going away by the time that I was able to get on a, a plane by myself. So like, like there certainly were definitely uh, different, uh, even if you right away, whatever secondhand smoking is just the permissiveness of, of smoking certainly has changed a lot. For people my age. 
Yeah, and I think this is kind of good news and the idea that you know, we talk a lot about increasing lifespan, but quality of life is equally or more important because, you know, to, to live to be an old age but to not be active may not be that fun. Versus here where if you're living, if, you are, if your 70s and 80s are a lot like, you know, people in their 50s and 60s were a few decades ago, then that's meaningful. And, you know, we've seen the, you know, uh, you know, seen some interviews with, you know, some, you talk to some people who are in their hundred, you know, hundred years old, you know, yeah. and I've seen very articulate, interesting interviews with people. You go, you just keep going like, wait, this person's a hundred, like they're a hundred, you know, because, you know, when I was a kid, I can remember sometimes talking to people at 70 and they were just shaky and unsteady, et cetera. Um, and again, everybody, genetics plays a big factor in that. And we've seen, you know, we, you see that with people, you know, of an age certain now, you know, some people, you know, 75 sharp with their wits, some people not, whatever. And there's a lot of yeah. other components there. But overall, it seems to be a, a very good trend, the idea that, you know, that we're not. And I, because I, I think anecdotally, I've seen this, like, you know, uh, you know, my, my parents, you know, cogent and healthy so far and knock on wood and having conversations with them is different than I remember my grandparents when they, my grandparents were 10 to 15 years younger than them. Mm -hmm. And so... No, we'll see. So hopefully trend that continues. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, uh, and, and that is even on display considering the fact that like uh, 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 we're, we're, we're looking at a, a presidential election where both candidates were at an age where previously we would not think that that was uh, that would be a liability. The idea of, of candidates that are that are this old would look be looked at as all right. Well, you're past your prime. America will reject the idea that you are are uh, this close to the life expectancy. But at the same time now, uh, they're cogent enough and their brand is so well established because they have had so much time in the public eye that it's a help. Now the name recognition uh, uh, outweighs the the negative concept of it. So I think you can you can even look at uh, real world examples of how different we treat what your 70s are. Before yeah, it was just so, kind of putting you up to pasture. So something that's been brought up uh, here is like one of the reasons they account for this might be, you know, better nutrition or higher, you know, more access to nutrition. We certainly have a problem with like the the, the body weights of elderly people are greater than they were before. Mm -hmm. And obesity is something that, that might be a big, bigger problem middle life to, towards later. But m later on in life, as your body just starts not clinging to calories the same way, it may be a thing where it's not as, as much of a disadvantage provided. Not, well, obesity probably would be, but being sort of on the heavier side. Uh, somebody brought up here said, hey, I'd rather eat what I want than add a few extra years to my life. It's a great thought, but that's not the way it works because it's like, I'd rather eat what I want, but then it's not that all of a sudden you add five years, it's the last 15 years aren't spent with diabetes. You know, that's the problem <laughs> is that it, it's not that like, ah, if I have the stickers bar, ah, I'll just take six months off your life. No, it just means the last part of your life, you're not going to be as healthy as you would have been. Mm -hmm. And that's what sucks. You know, is when you see people who are, they're not dead. They're alive, but they're taking a bunch of pills and medicating because maybe it was their maybe it's food choices, maybe it's genetics, whatever. But it is, it's not as easy as just it's like ah, the cigarette takes a takes a couple weeks off my life. So what? It's like well, it's, well, it's and that's how they that's how they pushed it into us with cigarettes as a kid. Is like oh, a cigarette takes six hours off of your life. It's you know it's hard not to have that idea permeate into other unhealthy I know habits. I agree but it's no it's like no it <laughs> makes you have to walk around with an oxygen cylinder for the last six years of your life you yeah. know so uh it's the difference there so and again genetics is crazy too but for this case here I, I think that's a combination probably of diet and you know to you know geriatrics we understand a lot more you know we know a lot more about you know and I would I would argue Bryce that that internet and things like that have helped older people keep more alert, keep more active. You know, when you get older and you're not working and maybe your kids have moved on, you get less interaction. And you think of the idea of the old person sitting in the senior citizen mm -hmm. home, you know, watching TV, uh, that's not healthy. That's not fun. But if they're actively engaging, reading news, doing things like this and thinking about things and then, you know, yelling on Twitter, they're being active. And and that's yeah. a thing that I think is, is that the, we, you know, where this period where all we want to do is think about the negative aspects of social media and this. And I'm going to argue that I would say 90% of the problem is the way we as individuals choose to see things and interact with things. Oh, shut up, idiot. 
Okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. Uh, and I would say that we, we, we forget that, you know, we, we live in an ecos we live in an information sphere where, you know, an eight year old and a 17 year old can argue over things and they've never met before. You know, we don't yeah. know how to argue that and it's still problematic, but that conversation never existed before. It never happened before. And all this mm -hmm. is so new to us and it's, and we're, we're aware of all the down points to it, but we have to step back and say like, I have, I have friends who I have a, several friends who are visually impaired because of the assistive technologies in the iPhone and because of the existence of the internet, their function in the world has nothing to do with how sighted they are, hmm. you know, and that's kind of an amazing thing to think about. Yeah. I would love to see some kind of a, a, a I'm sure there's scientific research about it, but if, if you just think to mirror, you know, my upbringing was radically different when I realized that, I could have social interactions beyond my school friends and my family, the people that I was physically around, that I could find an internet message board that was talking about exactly what I wanted to talk about. And I could engage in, in that culture uh, in, in a very visceral way. And it made my life better. I could only imagine that, especially compared to the, the alternative, of uh, you know what happens in a senior citizen's home, or what happens as you slowly, you know, have a loved one pass away, and and the thing that like, but for example, my grandma, my grandma uh, uh, passed on very shortly after my grandpa did, because she lived her life with him, like her her world was wrapped around from when she woke up to when she went to sleep uh, about that now. Do I think that she would ever stop missing my grandfather uh, if she had an online life to plug into? Like, no, of course she would have. She would have had to re readjust it. But like, would having a community and a hobby to pour herself into have been beneficial? A hundred and fifty percent. And and I think that that is something that we should look at in a very real way as as a as a massive benefit. Uh, and just even from my perspective of like. Well, look, if it worked for me as an adolescent, then I'm sure it'll work for me when I'm 70 and nobody cares about my opinion, but I can still yell on Facebook. Yeah. I like our comment here. My grandma went through four more grandpas before passing on. Say what? Your, your, your grandma had a work ethic for which Viola Anzalone did not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on the subject of like the future of ways of which we interact, we've talked a lot about VR and I saw I saw this come up, and I thought it was cool. I thought, like, great, this is a cool first step. This is not the product I would want, but I want, you know, the third generation of this. And, and um, this company called uh, Ecto VR, E-K-T-O VR, has these robotic boots. And I think we actually talked about a solution like this. I think on just an episode a few, a few weeks ago, I, I brought up the idea of using robotics or something to sort of move underneath you instead of using the treadmill and what this is is basically you put these boots on and you walk in place as you start walking they slide backwards and you sort of kind of do this sort of moonwalk so it feels like you are you know are i don't know what it really feels like these things look very big and very heavy and you look at the person oh as God. they're walking like they're trying to kind of not bump into they look like their feet they look like they moon, look like moon boots, boots in the saw yeah. universe they look like big <laughs> face. Let's <laughs> put you into these. Would you like to play a game? And yeah. <laughs> your feet get trapped in these things. No, yeah, you would. You just like they. They do look like some Abercrombie model is going to be panicked when they realize their feet are locked into them. <laughs> yeah, but I think that again, I think they actually would be selling this. I, I I'd be curious to see what the the real world. You watch the person walk into this, and it looks like they got something heavy on their feet, and. I don't know how naturally that's going to feel like locomotion, but I could certainly see at a certain point solutions so like this. You are taking smaller steps because you're not stationary, but it's simulating you doing more with your with your foot and leg motion to make it uh, uh, to to give you more mobility in game. Well, if you pull up, yeah, there's video of this where you can watch them. Like VentureBeat has a video, and if you take a look at the thing in motion, you can see what it looks like as a person walks with them. And the idea is that uh, working with, like they have somebody playing Half-Life, you know, Alex, which, um, sorry that Brian's not here. 
<laughs> for many reasons, but that too. Uh, but you can see this person is sort of, it's weird because you see the thing where they're walking in the dark and you feel like they're just sort of following the cameras, following them along. But oh, but you it's... look at their feet. Yeah, it's like those videos where the people with the roller skates and they're kind of walking in place, but it's like motorizing yeah. him back. Wow. Yeah, and if you kind of squint, it looks like the camera's tracking this person as they walk, but actually they're being kept in place. But if you look at their feet, it looks like they they're lifting heavy things on their feet. You know, so I don't yeah. know. Yeah, never tried it. That's interesting. So yeah, so so it does. It's not like it's simulating the leg motion. You are walking. It's just slowly moving you back to the center, either yeah. in the walk or as your uh, as your pause. But largely, when you're walking, it is slowly just moving you. I wonder if if when you're uh, running, what what the what the situation is there. But that's fascinating. Yeah, I, yeah, I would be. I, I would also be, like, they have a pretty large space here in this test video that they're using, and so it's one of those things where, um, I don't know. You've seen the what is it the, um, the little the the thing where you get like strapped into it and you start walking, but it's a slippery or it's a slick floor. Like the treadmill approach, yeah. Yeah, like the treadmill yeah. stuff. Like at least that has a set footprint. Um, where this like this still they're still using a pretty large space he's not moving too far out of the center there but i i, I would also would like to see what this looks like if you have to kind of pick up the pace well i think yeah. for this they should have probably put a grid on the ground or a box on the ground so we can get an yes. idea because it is hard to tell but mm. i mean it looks like he's actually staying because it's a small room it's if you look at the size of the room it's only it it is it i will tell you this it is deceptive because you watch him and you feel like he's traveled a distance. Then you look at his feet and you're like, no, he's exactly in the same spot. Yeah. I, I actually think that the, the video that we're watching right now, he is walking in a fully black room, which I don't think does the, uh, the, the this, this experiment any favors because it, it seems as if he's moving a lot more than he really is. I, I, I think functionally in this entire video, you would be shocked Bryce at how small the circle would be of yeah. of where his feet actually fell. Yeah, I, I that would be a thing I would like to see of this is like, hey, we've you know we're using this wide angle lens, which makes rooms look bigger. But keep a look at like we've took all this video of all of his footfalls. He doesn't ex you know go past these boundaries or anything. Um, oh, interesting. He took like two now, small now steps. That, so so part of this that I would say would would be a little hard is that like. When you are walking a lot, it is going to take the times where you are, uh, where you're not moving to kind of move you back. And there's that moment at the very end where he's already taking a few steps and it's very kind of visibly sort of taking him, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a people mover style, like maybe an inch back or so. So mm -hmm. I would wonder whether or not that's just something that either in the process it's stabilizing you so you don't really even feel it. It looks a lot different than it would feel. Uh, and I wonder even how much your brain is just writing that off because that's not what you're seeing. That's not what you're hearing. That's not where you're immersed in terms of the, the VR of it all because I, I wouldn't be shocked if that guy in that moment who's supposed to be looking into this grate that he's pulled off doesn't even realize that he just kind of uh, a moon walked back uh, an inch. Yeah, I, I am. I think they've got something really clever here, and I don't want to bag on it. But I, it, you watch it, and you look at like his feet. Really feel like he's got like ten pound weights attached to his feet. So, and maybe you don't pay attention to that. Maybe you do. I've I've done underwater stuff with weights attached to my feet, and I can tell you, you're you're conscious of it. It does feel different. But I do think you know I'm excited to see more solutions like this. The treadmill thing. The problem with that is like. You the biggest problem most of my friends have with VR is finding a place to do VR. And it's yeah. not like most people have, oh, I have a VR room, you know, the 20 by 20 foot space where I'll just put the treadmill in the middle. I don't, very few of my friends have that opportunity. And you need to think about solutions that, you know, can I put a yoga mat here? Great, I can do VR. And yeah. you got, I think we need to be thinking more, how do you do it in a smaller space? So I think this is, this is a great, you know, step, pardon the expression, uh, 
And there's, you know, we've talked about the other ones of like using, you know, little robots that slide around under your feet and keep you moving. Uh, really, you know, treadmills that you don't have to be strapped into that function kind of like an upside down Segway that sort of just know which way you're going, balance you out and keep you moving, et cetera. And there's, there's a lot of potential solutions. We're in a great place with robotics and artificial intelligence right now that I think we're going to see some great solutions. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, especially for kind of a, uh, to be at a stage where it's like, Hey, we can start to show this to the press and all like that stuff gets Mm -hmm. miniaturized that stuff gets lighter um i i think that is a really cool idea and i would love to see what people do with it because you look at you look at something simple just like heelys and how for a very long time those became various forms of 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 viral trends just doing things with heelys um Mm -hmm. i it would be fascinating to see what people do with this and what kind of things you can do when you expand vr your VR space for, for everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Cause like I had a conversation with a friend of mine, like a week ago, two weeks ago. And I was talking about, remember the Segway skates, the Segway had like the, the wheels that go underneath your feet, the hoverboards. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. not the hoverboards. Not the hoverboard. no, 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 these were, these were, these were ones one under each foot. So if you look up, go to the Segway oh. site. Gotcha. Uh, and the, uh, do you see these things? I said, oh, these things are kind of cool because I'm like, something like this for VR could be kind of cool. And uh, if you go to... Uh, yeah, is that um, the... This might be at the Segway Drift yep. W1 yep. eSkates. Yeah. If you go to the website too, you can see those. So these are... These <laughs> these look like the... Uh, the what is it? The, uh, the one-wheel bikes that kind of are a thing now. But it was just little ones for each of your feet. That's kind of fun. It <laughs> and you don't strap them in. You just stand on them. You just stand on them. What? Oh wow! And because they balance so well, you don't need to worry about it. That's that's crazy. That's actually really cool. Yeah, they they actually like they've they came out with them. And then actually, if you look up the drifts like on Amazon, they started getting like you can get a pair for now for like two hundred bucks because uh, nobody is buying them as far as I know. <laughs> Not to. <laughs> and the problem was like I think they show the problem here. This guy, you can't go up a curve. He can't go up like a little. It's not even like a hard corner curve. Like that was like a fire ramp curve, uh, like a driveway curb. I would yeah. not. Maybe it would. Maybe it's safer. Maybe it's smarter that you don't strap into these things. But I would not. I would not trust the because I don't. I don't like hoverboards. I don't trust hoverboards either. And so I just look at this dude just standing on them raw dog in it and i <laughs> it couldn't be me well and by the way but, there, there was a moment in this video that we're watching where he got to not even a curve but like just some mismatched uh a sidewalk so there was a big lip and he I'm, I'm assuming the point of what he was saying is that he didn't even feel comfortable going over that which is uh, uh, that's, that's a problem for something like this. Yeah. And that was, that was you know, my friend, actually my friend Jordan who tried these, we talked about that because it, that was the biggest thing was that like, he, we just see this guy like a slight little sidewalk grade and be, they're brilliant. They're brilliant engineering. Let me make this clear. Brilliant engineering. You don't need to step. You just step on these things and move around. The problem was this guy came across literally a sidewalk with a slight little great, a little gradient on it mm-hmm. and pops off of it. And it's like, yeah, that there is. There is no hopping on these things and making one trip all the way down Santa Monica Promenade without a problem. Yeah. You know? yeah. And that's that's I'd say that's sort of the, the the limitation there. I will show you though some other cool stuff. If you go to Segway site, again, S E G W A Y, did we talk about their uh the some of their they have a really cool concept here or the device, the Lumo personal robot? No, they make robots now? Oh, Christ. They make, remember the little, se- they came out with the little Segway that sort of like the little hoverboard kind of thing that kind of came between your knees a bit. Um, kind of their version of the hoverboard. So okay. go, go, just go to the website, go look up consumer and look up the Lumo. Sure, consumer. And this is brilliant. This is actually a brilliant idea. And what it is, imagine a hoverboard with the middle of it that has a camera stock and it will follow you around. And when you're not using it, it can perform like a little robot that can do like, you know, 
be a, uh, you know, go show up at a meeting for you or something too. So it's this transporter. So, you know, watching a video here of this thing, seeing, we're seeing the guy who's zipping around on his little mini transport, looking pretty cool, pops off the thing. And all of a sudden the thing, you know, they'll follow you. There's got like a camera and a display on it. Oh, okay. So it's a hoverboard with a camera up your crotch. And it'll follow you. Well, no, it's not looking up your crotch. But well, yeah, you, you, literally, the yeah. the guy's walking five feet ahead of it as it follows him through the office. Then he hops onto it to start riding it around. And now a guy's, you know, doing the robot and then <laughs> talking to the robot. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So it is uh, a camera, like a video camera. It is a personal robot assistant. And it is a hoverboard. And it's like a dolly camera. Yeah. There's like camera functionality in here too. That's wild. Oh, and you can look through it. It's a drone. It's a, of course yeah. it's a drone. It could Whoa. This See, uh, Brian could have been here for this right now. He could he <laughs> would have bought two of these, I feel like. So oh my this is this is really cool. Okay. Wow. Is this like the is this the final form? Is this what kind of an all-in-one uh, robot assistant device looks like? Like, is this the final form of this, I guess is what I'm asking more? I don't know, but when I saw it, I thought it was brilliant, the idea of combining, you know, the device with a personal robot, because I do see, I could see a thing where, you know, you if you if you were in a situation where you wanted some form of transportation that was like, or you'd use a scooter or something else, but the idea that you could use this, hop into a store, and it would follow you through the store, you know, or go wait for you, or go come to you, or, you know, perform little tasks. I, I think that, I don't know if this is the version of it, but, I mean, pretty impressive. 30-mile range, you know, the idea that it can follow you when you need to be followed, et cetera. A now- very cool idea. I I will say just to go down and get postmates that's worth it like that 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 is that is worth it just just to ride that do uh, you have that go down and and uh, just put the order right there on the tray and have them roll back onto the uh, elevator come back up Mwah, chef's kiss I would love it that yeah. really, well that sounds a lot like Dog. those uh the robots that are on like school campuses now you you guys have mm-hmm. surely seen stuff about these, right? The it looks like this brand is called Starship, but they just in on like college campuses and stuff, they'll just have these little fools walking up and down the sidewalk delivering things. Yeah. I could see, yeah, yeah, I could see like 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 where I live, my apartment complex, I could see them but building like a little robot door and just sending my my robot out to go get my my delivery from the sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, all right. Bryce, okay. Do you know how much a Lumo costs? I do not. All right. So I'm gonna let, let's go. Prices, prices, right? Uh, 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 style in this. Uh, Andrew, do you know? I looked it up before. Okay. All okay. right. Here we go. Justin, you know? Bryce, how much is a Lumo? Ooh. Free shipping from Segway official. Go. Okay. 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 Gotta take the shipping out. Gotta take the shipping out. Take the I shipping would... right out. So it's a Segway. It's like oh, it's a it's a hoverboard. It doesn't have the handle, but it's a hoverboard. It's a camera. It's got um, it's got audio because you can hear it and you can make it speak. It's got like yeah. a screen and an app. Ooh, I'm gonna say thir- thirty five hundred, three thousand five hundred. It's also Holy programmable crap. price. You can actually, you know, like you, you can create programs with drag and drop interface for it. It's your telepresence avatar. Oh. Oh. Uh, Bryce, if you've already carved out $3,400 out of your personal budget to buy a Lumo, do I got good news for you? <gasps> because you can have this Lumo not for $3,400, not for $3,000, not even for $2,000. It can be yours today, Bryce, for $1,799.99. Wow. That is that is insane. That is actually insane, I think. For for all of the things that are in this and then on top of it like the Segway branding. Like if this was like this feels like a a good 
Z- Ziyun knockoff price. This doesn't yeah. even feel like a segue. Wow, that's incredible. I'm shocked I haven't seen any out in the in 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 the wilds of the Bay Area. To be yeah. honest with you, because you see a lot of dumb tech stuff out here. Uh, but like, that's actually like I don't know. Maybe I should be paying attention to the people on those hoverboard uh, hoverboards more because maybe they are rocking with those. Well, and this is the next thing. Once all those hoverboards explode, they're gonna get a new one. Well, and I gotta yeah. get the night. I gotta get the next get one. one. I mean, when you think about it, the concept of it really isn't all that radical, considering in a world where we're building in a personal assistant to every where microwaves and clocks have voice assistants and stuff built in. Like the idea of a hoverboard, which is already X amount of expensive, uh, being able to uh, have that sort of functionality. The, the question is really what the killer app is when it's meandering around with you. Like what is mm-hmm. like, cause like even that demo, there's a lot of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure for, if you are a programmer or something like that, you're like, Oh no, the platform is what I care about. I can program something that I really know and want like into it, but there's no consumer like, Oh, I got to get this for my, for my, uh, uh, you know, uh, non tech savvy person in my life. In the, I would, I'll, mm-hmm. Oh, please uh, in the demo, they show a photographer. So he has a lot of opportunities to stop and get off and get the shot and then hop right on and do all the dolly zoom stuff. Um, and then it like cuts to him like handing out posters for like his band or something. So there's, it, yeah, there are like, like a, and he's like watching it from the other end of the park. Like he's like a parent who's watching his kid try to sell, you know, a, a, a scout cookies or something like that. Yeah. So, I, uh, I, 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 I could almost see. Sorry, when, uh, I, I could almost see like a courier system. Like I could see an uh, in-city, big metro area, may, maybe like a courier doing short deliveries. Um, but otherwise, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Is I'll give anything? you, I'll give you some thoughts on this. Like uh, my thoughts, because like often it's like you had some engineers who came up with a really cool thing, and then some marketing people thinking, oh, what about this? What about this? Whenever they put like their problem about, hey, here's the SDK to do stuff, it means like they're waiting for the world to show them what to do with it. Yeah. Uh, my thoughts on this are, one is I would love an attachment to like put that camera much higher. Like yes. if you could put that three or four feet up. And I get, I understand too with motion, you're going to get sort of, but there are ways to compensate for that too. Like I think putting, having an attachment where the camera can go higher would be great. Like you could go step in, like you could have the camera extract. Think about, guard mode at night or whatever where you want the thing to just patrol your house you hear a noise yeah. go to the noise the complaints have been tracking and i've seen this i think i told you before about a demo i went to in like downtown burbank where these people had this cooler that would follow you around i'm like oh you know what are you using for tracking bluetooth like no optical i'm like well that'll be a problem like no it works great and the woman goes to demonstrate it for me and a guy walks right between her and the robot at that time and it starts to follow the dude which is like <laughs> oh hey it's like hey, i got confused i'm like yeah, because you, you're you're basically just locking onto you know it's they're you know and, and that's a thing that will improve, but mm-hmm. that's improvable. Better algorithm for tracking and being able to follow would be great. But yeah, have an app where it's like oh this thing can go patrol your house at night. I don't know if you saw the Amazon indoor drone from yeah. uh, from Ring. Ring. Yeah, yeah, it seemed interesting. I mean, an interesting idea. You hear a noise come into it, and then the clueless burglar who's frightened by a you know, six-ounce drone. Yeah, but, I, I think that that, to me, makes sense. If you got, like, you know, a, a lake house or a rental property or something like that, and it's just, like, you want the peace of mind of being able to see it, now you can. You can literally well, I, just do a walkthrough. As a guy who had a townhouse that he was never at yeah. 2,000 miles away, I totally see the value of something like of that, that oh, the yeah. ring drone. Uh, but with this thing, I could see uh, attachments could be an interesting thing. Like, oh, yeah, this thing will patrol your house while you're not there. That's kind of cool. I could see a a thing that's like a pop-up sort of like I don't like groceries sort of hold your groceries, you know, while you shop kind of thing. You know, I could see the mm-hmm. idea of creating some sort of like an accessories that do other cool functions could be valuable and obviously probably iterating over the intelligence on it so it gets better at what it's supposed to do. Yeah, I'm 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 still so surprised by how how cheap this device is and how much 
that that tech yeah. that that sensing technology is going to get with the tracking how much cheaper camera technology is going to get that like may, maybe everyone has a do it themselves or maybe they just put this technology into more things right maybe you just go and your shopping cart does this for you you stand in front of it and you wave at it and it follows it follows you around the store and it's it's scanning stuff as you put stuff in um i don't know i could see both ways in terms of the miniaturization of this technology yeah, we'll see. A lot of the stuff that it has, a lot of the, the technology in there is stuff that's kind of like, you know, the, the 3D sensing chips, things like this, or things that are commercially available. It's how you package it. And and I don't know uh, if Segway is going to be the one that's going to build a version that everybody wants, but I could see there is some version. Like, we all look at this and go, oh, this is cool, you know, because when it's not my hoverboard, it's a robot. And that's, yeah. you, you go, oh, okay, you know, that seems useful. I'll, I'll point to one more thing here. If you go onto the Segway site and you click on professional or hover over professional and then click on the Segway S pod. Oh, now just looking at the silhouette on the icon of the menu here, this definitely looks like the chairs from Wally. Uh, yep. <laughs> the seating, the, okay. A seated Segway. So how does this work? You're, are you still balancing it? Are you moving it forward with your body weight? Are you programming it? I don't, I don't know. This is this. I would not. I think like I that, remember. It, cooks. it goes 25 miles an hour. Yeah. Wow. I, oh, crap. Just so see. that's 25 miles an hour at 330 pounds. That that thing burns. Oh, there's a video. Uh, S pod chair first ride review. I think I do remember us talking about this because uh, this was like a CES thing, right? I'll tell you what, a uh, 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 friend of the show, Darren Kitchen, uh, when all the scooters were uh, uh, descending upon the Bay Area, was like into trying to buy his own version of the scooters. And he bought a couple. The one that goes the fastest gets up to about 25 miles an hour. And let me tell you, when you're on a scooter that's going 25 miles an hour, you are feeling the speed. Like like it it is something where you are keeping up with city traffic uh uh that like that is a that is a burner yeah okay so there's a uh we've got someone doing a hands-on review so he sits in it oh i don't like this calibration it it, it he he sits on it and it's like kind of leaned forward and it's 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 balancing i guess it's figuring out the... yeah, no, yeah it's figuring out where you're leaning forward so it knows what the triggers are but i'll tell you what that's easy though that's the no, there's a little controller. There's a thumb controller. He's got his hand on a controller that's telling oh, him. Oh, he does? To okay, cool. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. So we definitely did just watch him bump into his own camera. So okay. Yeah. If it's if it's hand controlled, oh, but he's that he's texting in that shot. Um, <laughs> wow. I yeah, there's just they show Dr. Evil's chair later on. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, is this okay? This is li these are this is literally the Wally -E chair though at this point. Is so is this, is this what is this going to do to our I old people? Can I tell you tw like 20 years ago when Segway first got announced or whatever it was, I did same classroom where I'd met Justin. I gave a talk and I said, "Hey, look at the Segway. I bet you what they're really going." And I thought that Segway was going to go build something like this within a year or two. I thought this was really direction they're going because I'm like I'm like, this seems like the self-balancing sort of upright kind of thing seems like it would be the really cool application because then I can go drive in traffic, you know, because like yeah. otherwise, you know, things design motorized vehicles optimized for sidewalks. You know, we're, we're still you know, the, the judgment still out on that. But I mean, I, I, I think not only is it a good idea, but uh, certainly if you're looking at like where that this technology is going for like accessibility and stuff like that. Like that's, that's huge. Like, like, like no yeah. matter, no matter what we think about anybody who needs a, a moving chair, the idea of where we can go with wheelchairs or, or motorized uh, uh, scooters and stuff like that, like that's, that's life changing. I, I mean, if you could have something that books like that and then is as robust and can get over things without uh, uh, hesitation, like, and can balance you to the point where it's as safe as it could possibly be like, that's, that's you know a, 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 a different lifestyle for for folks who uh, uh, don't have the same mobility. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the concept that they show here is a full seat, you know, a full first class, you know, airliner seat. But I bet, you know, again, you like can miniaturize this stuff. You can put like stair stepper wheels on this. Like you, you, this could be like a really powerful uh, wheelchair alternative or a new advancement in wheelchair yeah, technology. Just, just rethinking that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And making it look cool as hell. Like that's that's that even you know it's it's like one half of the joke, but also I think for for accessibility reasons, like if it, if you could look cool as hell in in an awesome new uh, uh, situation like this, like that's I think that mentally is is a is a great idea. Yeah. Yep. Gentlemen, we got picks. Yeah, I got a pick. pick? Um. I watched this show that nobody's ever heard of or talked about, uh, Ted Lasso, and I was charmed by it. It is a charming program. Uh, it reminded me a lot of our friend Brett Rounceville, uh, because he, uh, of all the people that I know, I think the only person that would randomly go to England and try to coach a premiership team uh, would be Brett. Although, oddly enough, the personality of his assistant coach is also the personality of Brett's wife, which kind of complicates my metaphor a little bit. But uh, I, I, I've I've enjoyed it uh, very much. A very smartly written show, and uh, uh, I've I've uh, I've I've liked it. I've liked the 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 good hearted nature of it. Uh, Ra Radical Woody in our chat says Ted Lasso is everything I wanted Space Force to be. I definitely finished watching that first, the first episode of Ted Lasso, and I watched all of Space Force season one that came out, uh, and thought this is like the next, like this is this is someone developing a workplace comedy show that works. This is the next one that works, and you look at Space Force trying to do that, and Space Force not really figuring it out. Um, I, I think that's I think it's so great and it's 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 like unabashedly positive and it's just swell and it's just sweet. Uh, I I really dig it. Um, I will say like I you know I'm kind of cynical and I'm waiting for I'm waiting for a shoe to drop on time. I'm still waiting for a shoe to drop. But maybe maybe it'll keep. How, how, how far how far are you in or are you caught up? Uh, no, I'm not caught up. I'm thinking I'm four episodes in. I just watched the gala episode. Yeah, uh, we you, from from that point, you get a little bit more of the complication of of the Ted character. But even in the complication, the 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 North Star of positivity and goodness is is kind of retained. Uh it's just smart. It's just a, it, it's it's a smartly written show that isn't trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, uh, you know, you know where it's going from pretty much the first <laughs> frame of it. Uh, uh, you, know, you can look at the poster and kind of guess what happens when the the plucky over his head American coach uh, comes into the cynical world of uh, British football. But uh, at the same time, the point isn't what is going to happen. The point is how it happens and uh the cast is charming the yeah. the writing is really really competent and efficient and uh cheers to, to apple this is the first time that i think you know uh, a, a television show has really kind of resonated like uh like like ted lasso has for for apple so cheers to them to for, for getting this uh getting this right yeah yeah and i'll and i'll say I, he he goes through stuff and and you you get there's that's not everything's the, the 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 being in the presence of tad lasso isn't always, you know, great, so yeah. to speak, oh, okay. kind of thing. Like there, there's more. There's more. Yeah, they, it, it gets more complicated. But it is gotcha. a cozy show. It's a show yeah. to make you feel good, and and that's one of the things often you'll see in shows that like, like Parks and Rec is like a perfect kind of show because there are going to be adversity, there's going to be stuff, but you're always going to want to be there and be part of that community and feel good because it's escapism. Shows I've seen sitcoms where they go, well, we want to go deal with this subject, and that's when they become less fun because it's like, no, I like this because I'm stressed out, and I just want a warm blanket, not like, ah, what about this thing in the world we've got to deal with? And it's like, and that's the, the showrunners I think often forget that, you know, they feel like, oh, but I want to deal with the big things. I, I think that's mm -hmm. and it, there there are shows where the plot understands why we want to be there, right? And and it's it's. You know, sometimes I think there's there's a tendency with shows to be like, oh no, the driving force of the plot is going to be that like we're removing the reason why you're having fun, 
Like, I wonder if we'll remove the reason why you're having fun. It's like either no, you're not, or B, if you do, if you do, you're going to ruin the show. So yeah. this is just, I'm not even enjoying this conflict. And that's, that's the fun part. There is a little Hudsucker proxy kind of uh, 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 element of Ted Lasso, but that's not the point. That's not why you're there. Th those aren't the, the things that you're dealing with repeatedly. And that's what makes it super fun. Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, I, yeah, Bill, no. Bill Lawrence created, I did not realize it, co -cre uh, creator of Scrubs. I was behind Ted yeah, Lasso. Yeah, Scrubs, Sloan High, uh, uh, Cougar Town. Like, uh, uh, that dude knows how to make sit, like quick, snappy, sitcom -y, uh television. Yeah, I I enjoyed it. And, and the problem, I, I go back to Space Force, is it didn't know what it was. It was like, oh, we got a premise that sells itself. Like, nah, maybe consistent characters. And it was interesting to watch... You know, out the the other the other producer of that you know did upload, which I thought was fantastic, and the characters are consistent. I understood the rules of the universe and I enjoyed it. Where Space Force is one moment he's the dumbest guy in the world, the other moment he's super smart helping his daughter with homework and stuff. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know what the rules are here. I don't know what this universe means, so I don't know if something's important or not. And and that's when jokes just started not kind of landing because it was such a. And we'll see you know if they do a season two of Space Force because Parks and Rec had a lot of fixing from season because you know let you know her her character in season one was an idiot in season two an idiot obsessed with some dude in season two they're like those are the least interesting things about her let's not make her dumb and let's you know, get ease that character out and make her more complicated and it became a great show yeah um i've got a pick uh i uh am uh i i won't say on the bandwagon but i have definitely uh uh seen what what everyone's talking about uh with the, a new little video game out there called among us have you guys heard about this oh ashley is, ashley is obsessed about among us she just keeps calling me sus <laughs> so among us is a um is like a um what is a good way to describe it it's social if you've ever played deduction. it's social deduction okay. yeah okay it's uh That's, it, it's like werewolf. If you played werewolf or Avalon, um, secret Hitler, secret Hitler, like all, 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 all those, all those games where you're trying to find out there are good guys and bad guys and, and activities are happening and you are deciding whether or not people are screwing up or if they are actively trying to sabotage. Uh, and then you are deciding amongst yourselves whether or not, uh, to eliminate certain people round by round. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and and so I, it's it's a really interesting story uh, in of itself because this game uh, came out in 2018 and it is just now blowing up as this big thing. Oh partially, wow! Partially I didn't because know that. it's free to play on mobile with ads. It's five dollars on desktop to play. The premium version on mobile is like two or three dollars. Uh, there's crossplay between all of that stuff, and. Uh, uh, they, I, I think the the com Inner Sloth, the company that makes this, even just announced this past week, like, hey, we were going to work on Among Us too, but we're just instead we're going to keep updating Among Us th this game. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I there, I don't, I don't play a lot of online games. Uh, you know, there are not too many games where I'm like, oh yeah, I really want to go and interact with other gamers. That sounds cool and like a good time, and I'm going to be good at those games. Of course, I love playing Call Call the Duty. Uh, but, uh, this one was one where like I played a few times with, with friends on other like discord servers. And I actually went and found myself occasionally going in and just playing in random lobbies because this is a lot of text-based chat. Um, and it's very kind of specific about, you know, when you should and can't talk to people. Right. So a lot of people who stream this game, if you're playing with that person, you cannot watch their stream cause you're going to know if they're. Yeah. Uh, a good guy or a bad guy but you're also um you you don't even do voice chat while it's like 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 even a big shh sign comes on right when you start the game because there's no talking while you're playing until there's like a big meeting so it's 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 interesting i think they've done a good job of like of of reinterpreting you know a pretty uh standard type of genre with with these kind of deduction or trader games um and uh, making it making it really simple, you know, making like you're the trader and you either got to kill everybody or 
you know, uh, 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 what is it? Sabotage them or you're the good guys and you got to do your tasks or find the traitor. So it's, it's, it's really cool. I am like really digging it among us. I, yeah, I think what's, what's fascinating about it is you take the social deduction concept and then you just add menial, uh, video game kind of tasks to it where it's like, all right, well you have to fix the thing. And so instead of, you know, in a board game version of it, you're like, oh, you didn't fix the thing because you've made a decision to not fix the thing because maybe you don't have the cards in your hand or something like that. And you can say, I didn't have the cards in my hand when really you do and you're lying. Uh, in in Among Us, there is the idea of like, oh no, the, 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 the thing went off too late and I couldn't make my way there. And, and so like, that's obviously why. So there is a little bit more randomness that you can add to it that I think heightens the idea of like, okay, are you competent at this or are you sus? It's one of those multiplayer games that has tapped into an interesting paradigm that not a lot of other online multiplayer games do, which is like, uh, if you ever play Watch Dogs or Watch Dogs 2, those are like contemporary hacker games. And so you're going around and you hack the planet, whatever. Um, And those are like online hide and seek modes. On a Gibson, man. (laughs) <laughs> where people can just invade your game and they have they will show up as an NPC in your game and they have to blend in and steal all your data and and uh, when you're getting stolen from you have to you know go and find this person when you're the person you have to kind of blend in there are not a lot of games that have you pretend to be another entity either another NPC or another player um, I, I think that's really interesting because in this one, you have to follow human behaviors. Okay, well, these are the tasks that people normally have to do. So I have to go here and I have to stand here and I have to pretend like I'm doing a thing. But I can't pretend to do it at this one because when you do it at this one, the bar shows up. And so if you walk away and the bar doesn't move, then people know that you're it. Like, like there's, um, what's the other game? Spy Party does that a lot where you have to pretend to be uh, like an AI in a dinner party and someone is a sniper. It, it, there, there are not a lot of examples of games doing that sort of, of disguising. And I, and I think it taps into something really cool like this. So among us, I among love us. it. Yeah. It's great. Andrew. Uh, I just, uh, just a quick throwback to our earlier segue discussion. I just sent Bryce this link cause I was looking through the site and they actually have their own electric scooters that are robotic and they will return to the charging station by themselves and they have like a pedestrian collision so check out the segway site s-e-g-w-a-y to see some of the stuff they're working on sure um, this is but the... my pick okay yeah go ahead oh yeah you can show yeah yeah you can show it. that's fine uh, wanna... so this is the, video of the kick scooter t60 from segwayrobotics.com uh semi-autopilot segway cloud so it i mean it looks like a three uh, it, it looks like a three-wheeled Segway. Um, yeah, two wheels in the front, and then it says it's got a, it's driving itself because it's got a low battery, and we watch it pull up to its own charging station to charge. Oh, so like it's like a little outdoor parking spot with with chargers in the ground. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. So kind of a cool, like yeah, imagine these scooters driving themselves down the sidewalk with collision <laughs> avoidance and stuff. Very weird future. My pick is, and I enjoyed this. I didn't think I would. I'm not normally a cartoon guy, although between Rick and Morty and Lower Decks, that's changing. Camp Cretaceous. Camp Cretaceous? Have you watched this? I have not. Yes, Jurassic Park Camp Camp Cretaceous. It is a Netflix series, animated series, and it takes place at the same time frame as Jurassic World, and it involves a group of five kids who get invited to... Camp Cretaceous, because you see on the same island as Jurassic World, they actually were building a summer camp for kids where you could go spend a week with the dinosaurs. And these were the first kids that get to be part of the testing of Camp Cretaceous. And then Abdominus Rex gets loose. And so it's the same time period as the movie. And so these kids are at the worst summer camp ever. (laughs) <laughs> and basically have to try to survive the you know survive the dinosaurs and their own teen dynamics. That's a great concept. That's such it, a great such a great IP for a cartoon. And it's fun. They uh, they went to Spielberg and said, "What advice?" And he said, "Don't hold back. Don't hold back." So people get eaten. 
there are people getting eaten. You know, not bloody, but like you know, the kids will watch. You know, the dino T Rex chase somebody down, or you know, Carnotaur chase somebody down, and then you see their reactions as they watch somebody getting devoured. And so, like, the stakes are you can get eaten, and you get to see another side of Jurassic World because I loved. I just went and watched the movie again last night because I had fun with that. It's not. I am a big Michael Crichton fan. The the book. And the movie, the original movie, will always have a special place in my heart, in particular the book, because of the complexity and everything else like this. But I also love to watch dinosaurs eating people, and I love theme parks. You put those two things together. Yeah. So here you get to see, like, they show what's it like to do a zip line over parts of Jurassic Park, you know? What's it like, you know, the monorail, like more from point of view of the monorail stuff, the Mosasaur, all these other sort of things that we saw, the Jurassic Park, the river the river canoe ride. What is that? And so just to see that part of the world built out by itself is cool. Then to put a bunch of teenagers in peril. Fun. Yeah. So it's just fun. How does it it's, fit in a, in a series format? It, like in an episodic, does that feel like it makes sense compared to like the films, I guess. So <laughs> it is, it takes place over the span of a couple days. Okay. Okay, so like I said, of like like basically in the background, you're hearing events from Jurassic World take place. Like what's the you know, Claire or whatever the uh the uh Bryce Dallas Howard's character, the other people on the are trying to get a hold of her on the radio, and you hear radio chatter that was in the movie of stuff going on, and so that takes place there. So it's roughly the same time span as it maybe starts like a day or two before like Jurassic World. So it takes place the same span there. And then as far as what the next season would be I'm not going to say, but uh, it, it does it really well. It fits into the universe quite well. And as far as I know, it's it's canonical. So, um, cool. yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's not like, it's just, like I said, I enjoyed it. The, they're 22-minute episodes. They kind of have cliffhanger stuff. And I would say that it is a, a much more entertaining than the second half of, of Fallen Kingdom, which, you know, all of a sudden we put dinosaurs in Luigi's mansion and it's like, what's going on? <laughs> right, cool. So. Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. On Netflix. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Hey, look at that. We did it, everybody. We did it. We did it. We did it. We really, really did it. Um, alrighty. Uh, are we gonna do an after things today? I'm up for it. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can do it. I'm good. Cool. Let me click a few buttons here. Let me see if I can't. Give me one second. Let me. Hardware, ex hardware accelerate that. That'll do something. Um. How was your weekend, Juice? Uh, good, good. Got some, uh, got some stuff done. Uh, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, I know that your initial COVID test was leaked in in transit, as you posted on uh, Twitter. Have right. you have you uh, gotten another one, or where 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 are you at with that? So I got a COVID test on Sunday. I got a rapid COVID test on Sunday. Uh, okay, and it did come back negative. So. Uh, that was a good incubation period for me because my exposure yep. date would have been Monday or Tuesday. And yep. uh, that Thursday test, which did get leaked in transit, would have been a starting off point. On the earlier side, but you had no symptoms. And, and right. I, I presume you don't have symptoms now. So exactly. So you're feeling you're feeling pretty good then. Feeling feeling pretty good. The uh, the the rest of the folks who are staying at the studio, because there are a number of folks staying at the studio for different reasons, um, they're getting testing done today. Some of it is rushed. Some of it will be a few days. Uh, but at the moment, they want to keep isolation and totally totally understood, totally heard. So we're doing yeah. we're we're checking out the shows from my house today. Uh, so thank you everyone for dealing with. A difference in sound quality, difference in stream quality. Uh, going to make yeah. some adjustments before Chord Killer starts. I will tell you that. Um, but uh, uh, Is Chord Killers going on? We will be doing Chord Killer. So uh, we will have Ayaz as a guest and Lamar Wilson okay. is back who's going to co-host with Tom. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. So gotcha. it'll be, yeah. The, and uh, uh, so that'll be, that'll be good. And we'll get, we'll get spoiler in time done and we'll be able to get all our other stuff. But uh, 
Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a weird time. You know, that, getting that rapid test was super weird because I had to go to like an urgent care place and get it out of pocket. Yeah. And I thought it was going to all be curbside. And then they were like, OK, now please come inside of this hospital for your into it or into a room. Um, yeah. The, the place that does it around me is they set up a little tent outside uh, uh, so you don't have to go in. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, they just run it out of, out of there, but boy, can you not beat that 15 minute result? Like that is, uh, that is, that is a, a big peace of mind. I, uh, so the one I did also was one of those Quidel 15 minute tests. I was actually a little worried because I rolled up and they do the test really quick and they don't even go inside the sinus capillary. They just kind of hit. Hitch you, hitch you in the rim, yeah. and uh, I'm like, okay, cool. This will take this will take 15 minutes. I'll be good. And then 15 minutes goes by, and then 30 minutes goes by, and then 45 minutes goes by. And wow, you were just sitting in the car. 60 minutes. I'm in the exam room. I'm still sitting in the exam oh, room. God. And I'm like, Jeez. okay, I've been here a long time. Does that mean that I had a positive test, and they have to figure all of my stuff out, or? Or, or what, you know, because they weren't busy. It was like early in the morning. Yeah. I, there was no one else there. Um, it ended up being fine. I think it might have been because because I listed that I had a COVID exposure that the doctor had to come talk to me about that. Um, oh, okay. But uh, the, it wasn't, I, a very, it wasn't in depth. Time, it, the lady was like, she had all this like paperwork. And I'm like, I didn't say it to her because I wanted to minimize any talking, but I just wanted to be like, just yell. Can you just, just yell? I'm good. Like, thumbs, like you can thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Exactly. <laughs> I, I just need you to tell me immediately. I don't need you to highlight all the highlight that you can do that after you just yell that I'm clear. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'll, I will be right back. Sure. Go take a break. Have you gotten uh, you co- uh, uh, any COVID tests, Andrew? You probably have, right? Oh, I think you have muted yourself. There you go. Uh, thank you. I thought about doing the like the antibody test at some point if I wanted to go through the hassle. We we keep like we're shut-ins. Like the number of people that I've been around without a mask on, you know, has been like four friends. You know, one of them already had COVID, so he's theoretically not going to ha- pass it. And then two other friends were as precautious as we are. And then and that was a couple of months ago. And then I have one friend who, um, he's the one I worry about because, like, uh, you know, he's a smart guy, but it's also, like, I, I, he's young and kind of pro-social in sort of ways. So I think that he might be the one, if I were to say, who's going who's gonna to accidentally get it, <laughs> you know? It would be from that so person, maybe. we just, yeah, we just don't, like... Like I had a friend that said, "Oh, do you guys want to go eat?" And there's a lot of places have opened up and do outdoor dining down here. And you know, my girlfriend looks at me and she's like, "I don't want to leave the house." She just yeah. doesn't. And I have to assure my neighbors that she's alive and well. And that you know, <laughs> no, she's real. Alive. No, my girlfriend's not only really real; she's alive. Yeah. It it definitely is like really. I mean, our specific incident is really weird timing because I was like, just me and my friends had gotten tested recently, and we were like, okay, we can. Like literally the two of us, very recent negative tests. We both don't go out. We could just hang out at my place and like talk. And then all of this stuff happens. And so um, it just ended up, it just, but, but I have friends who like have a very big social pod, I guess. It, it, like they, at least for the most case, had worked from home remote, had completely been working from home and so all, all of their friends had to. And so I don't know. I, it definitely does make me just ick up a little bit when I hear like, oh, yeah, no, I went over to my friend's house. And then we went over and we went and, and had a brunch. And then we went, you went shopping and stuff. I'm like, oh, oh OK. So, yeah. <laughs> must be like nice. Two of, my girl, two of my girlfriend's friends, like one of them was a friend that was like was you know wanted to go take a and my girlfriend's like don't go don't go don't go don't just go to a trail or some other place came back now she has covid you know another friend who you know take precautions stuff and then he just got it but like it was the one that were like no don't go do this you're being stupid no not i'm doing doing and now she has it and it's like 
uh, and but the other one was cautious who you know he got it too and and that's why i'm like if you get it if somebody gets it like don't beat yourself up over it like don't it's like you can you can take everything in the world then all of a sudden you know you breathe through the side of your mask you know because the seal's not right and so be careful be careful be careful but like for anybody out there's got it you know who's just like like don't yeah it's, it's it's weird and it's it's we don't know everything like be super super careful but if something happens don't yeah tear yourself up over it um you know yeah you know i mean it's it's such a tough thing because like it is it is dangerous and like uh it's it's no you know it's no joke um and also yeah, I, have, I have friends that uh, are, deal with lingering effects yeah. months and months and months ago they're still you know not a full capa- respiratory capacity and stuff so yeah. yeah it's uh i was thinking about this the other day it's just hard it's hard to deal with it because it's so varied like you know we have you know you watch sports now and and people are like oh you know a couple players out for covid like the the marlins the, the miami marlins the uh you know at the beginning of the season, half their team went out with COVID and then they made the playoffs. And so it's like, okay, is it like an ankle sprain? <laughs> is it like, you know, like something like, like that? And then of course, obviously it's deadly. It's lethal, right? Like, uh, and then it's everything in between too. It's like the worst flu you've ever had plus lingering, or it's, you never even know you have it. Like there's, there's, it, it's, it's so I think that's partly socially why it's so pernicious beyond everything that I think we wind up focusing on. uh, It just is sending so many different social signals that of course people are going to gravitate to the one that they find to be the most compelling, be it extraordinarily careful or very cavalier because you're going to seize on, on this other stuff and, and combine that with the fact that you can spread it before you know it. And uh, uh, you have the, the the social problem that you have with this. It's it's insane. My and my frustration comes from like, and I I don't think it's a function of any individual. I think it's sort of the pattern of the way bureaucracy. Our, our health organizations were not equipped to handle something like this, globally. Globally, every 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 na- like. There are some countries that responded better, but sometimes because of geographic isolation, they had better strategies. But as far as the information processing part of it, it's problematic because it's like, so you heard the story about the person who like got a second case of it, right? Right. There have been cases of people getting it again. What do you know about that? Not much. I read a thing on the internet about how they got a second case. And so people who, yeah, like, oh, can you get, well, turns out that they, when they went in with the second case, when they isolated the genome of it, it had mutated. And so he got a second case of a mutated strain. Now, we don't know how fast the things mutate or whatever, but that's a thing. Like, it wasn't the same strain, but even a different strain. And that's the thing, too, is, like, we believe there's, like, what, three different major strains out there, you know, like, in different parts of the world and stuff. Yeah. And so... There was definitely a week there where we were talking about strains, and then we kind of stopped talking about strains, for sure. And I don't, I don't know why. And, and is it because we found contradictory evidence? Maybe. And that's the frustrating part is that I, and I, again, this is going to be my, this is by my rant was like, I'm, I'm still frustrated by the fact that we either, that health officials in January or February are telling us like, oh, you don't need masks, but wipe down your surfaces, which seemed counterintuitive to every SARS virus we'd ever had before that had been airborne. It was a very weird thing to say. Now it's like, Oh, maybe they said that to preserve masks. Yet the instincts of everybody I knew when they heard there was a mask shortage was millions of moms got out sewing machines and started making masks. Had we been making masks in February, we probably would have had less infections because more people would have been wearing masks. And then to get people into wear, and it was, to me, it was a colossal failure. And I'm frustrated because we continue to do this, this like, well, we only want to tell people this. We want to tell people that. And I'd, I'd argue like, I think that killed people. I think that thinking killed people, not not in a malevolent way, but the idea of, you know, we'll tell people what's best when we don't know. I'm like, I'm very much give people information, give people information. You yeah. Know. Uh, yeah. But the purpose of that was one, like, no, that was the who, that was the CDC. They were all saying that. They were all saying this. I can show you the tweets. No, I saved no, them. No, 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 no. I think uh, I think Stoic Squirrel was saying that was one person with the double infection. 
Uh, oh yeah, exactly. It, that one, yeah, one person we know, but yeah, exactly. And, and that was like, sorry, I didn't mean to jump on you. Um, but it is a frustrating thing because I've had people push back and be like, no, they didn't say that and not you, but I've had, I'm like, no, here's the tweet. Oh, well, the, the, that meant, you know, da, 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 you know, and it's like, geez, like, like, I don't think I, I don't think lying to people is a good policy. I, I just, I just think this is unlike, obviously it's unlike anything any of us have ever seen in our lifetime. And, uh, it's, it's insane. It's insane to look at what, what it is and how, again, how people think about it because you walk around the lake. I mean, like I, 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 I go, you just even in Oakland and Oakland's supposed to be, you know, a, a, an extraordinarily is an, an extraordinarily progressive city. One might think that it is the, the, the place for which you'd be like, Oh, like science is science is science or whatever. And it's like, even here, there's just a difference in opinion. There's just a difference in what people think uh, the, their line. I mean, like this wraps up so many ideas of what, who we listen to, why we listen to them, like uh, 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 when we feel safe, when we don't feel safe. Uh, uh, and I don't think that any of this is in the in the realm of like, well, you don't care about humanity, or 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 in the most like hyperbolic ways that we speak about it. I just think this is this is hard. This is a really, really, really hard thing to to kind of uh, uh, deal with. And just when you think you're out, you know, you 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 see the situation like like we've seen and and cases are rising after Labor Day. Hopefully it will not have the same situation uh, uh, as we saw uh, during during the summer because we at least know we know more. Uh, hopefully the flu season won't be as bad this year because, more people are wearing masks and understanding not to hug and kiss, uh, you know, people that you might hug and kiss otherwise. But boy, it, it's this is the this is the wildest thing I've ever seen in my entire life, and it is a social experiment to beat the band. Yeah. 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 Uh, you guys want to do Smasher Things talk? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Well then, uh, Andrew, well, I'll count you in. How about it? In three. Two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, that's me. Hi. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Uh good, man. Good. We're doing uh we're doing a okay. You know, a, a weird, weird episode without uh without without Brian, but uh we're we're getting we're getting we're soldiering on here for the week. For uh... I don't want to talk about Brian. I want to talk <laughs> about Raise the Dead season two. Sure. And what your plans are for this? Uh, so yeah, Raise the Dead season two. We announced it uh, last uh, just, week. I, I love Brian, and I do want to talk about him, but I just want to interject. That's okay. Please, not go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, last year we did Raise the Dead season one about the 1960 election. I knew I wanted to do uh, the second season. I wanted to do, well, I didn't know what I wanted the second season to be. I knew that I wanted to do at least a episode about the 1964 election because this it did not include some of the kind of big names that 1960 or 1968 uh, uh, includes. But I knew that there was interesting and good stuff there. And then the more I read about it, it went from me doing a one-off episode to me kind of doing more of a full season. So now it's going to be a three episode season and uh, it'll run throughout October. Uh, but I'm, I'm very excited to uh, excited to launch it. How was it scripting I... that out after the first season? A lot easier, a yeah. lot easier to do in, in the second season than it was in the first season. Uh, I had a sense of the structure uh, and really working on the second season helped me clarify, I think the DNA of the show a little bit more and also understanding the response to the first season uh, helped me clarify uh, the point of the show a little bit where the first season is very much kind of a, you know, as Brian would say, like the magic trick of like, what if I told you that these two unlike things in your mind were very much alike Ta da! at the end. Uh, whereas what I kind of realized in the second season is number one, I don't want to put the pressure of the show on every two alike uh, unalike things are the same, right? In 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 
in reality, what I want to do is uncover these patterns that kind of happen like uh, uh, over and over and over again. So we can sort of understand the world around us as opposed to me pretending like this thing is a shock. It's like, no, like these are our habits. These are recurring cycles. Let's understand them. Uh, and then also just under, you know, 1960 being an election that not a lot of people know enough about, and then 2016 being a very, a very fresh election, I had a lot more license to be like, oh, isn't it crazy that Nixon is acting like Hillary Clinton? Isn't it crazy that the Kennedys are acting like the Trump campaign? Whereas not a lot of people know anything about, you know, much about Barry Goldwater's effectively kind of this forgotten figure for people that aren't really into politics. Lyndon Baines Johnson is somebody that's like, barely remembered now unless you're mentioning Vietnam. So I have to re I have to introduce these characters a lot more than I than I had with the previous ones. And also it's like I don't have as fresh of an example because I wrote and produced the season before the end of the election, which hasn't happened. So this is more about the 1964 election with touchbacks to to our modern world. And sometimes they're, they take more time. Sometimes they are more, uh, a, a called shot than, than, uh, in, in other moments. But in general, I realized that this had to be 80% me telling you this story. And now I have the benefit of people being able to fall in love with these characters from the first raise the dead. And now kind of just tell you where they go, because guess what? It's really interesting. And spoiler alert, a main character dies in the first uh, mm. in the first five minutes. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, unfortunately, you may be able to get season three out before this election is really over. So, yeah, you know, and, uh, the uh, 2020 and 2000, the recount. Exactly. Uh, so I I'm excited about this and the the production quality, everything is great. And I'm impressed by how much of this you did on your own. What I remember going into originally Raise the Dead was, did you need to bring in outside people? What did you need? Yeah. And then there are, I've seen this with some of my clever friends where they feel like, oh, I need to get an expert to tell me what to do. And then they go do it themselves and they're able to do a, a damn good enough product that, yeah, sure, maybe somebody who had been doing it for years might've added something to it, but the quality they were able to do on their own was way better than I thought. And yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, if I, if, uh, uh, I do say so myself, it's, it's the best thing I've ever done. And I think it's, it's given me a perspective on what audio engineering quality is for podcasting. And, uh, uh, I, I, I think it's something that I have not only it's, it's made everything I've done much better. PX three is much better. The things that I can do and instincts that I have in five seconds would, would be something that I wouldn't even think to attempt in the past. Um, and, and that, that helps, you know, I, I think that it, it makes everything, uh, better going forward because, uh, we're in a world now where like podcasting has effectively grown out of what, succeeded in radio like if you look at like where the tendrils of podcasting go it's like everything is either kind of like news radio or sports radio uh but now you 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 can explore the space a lot more uh the mini series stuff really kind of grew out of the public radio this american life uh or or radio lab kind of examples that now you're like, oh, okay, well, what if we just focused on this story? And I think that what the reason why this format is so popular is because it gives podcasting something that it desperately needed, which is an entry point for people, an entry point for talent, an entry point for new listeners. The idea of, oh, drop into this show that has a billion different inside jokes or, or is about this thing and maybe you don't know where their perspectives are daunting, right? Do I have to go back and listen to all the old ones? Should I only listen to ones where the guests I, I like, blah, blah, blah. Uh, whereas this, it's like, oh, would you like a free audiobook? 
like here's a free audio book and maybe you'll have to listen to a title sponsor and an ad read in the middle. But other than that, here's just a free, like very intricately produced uh, podcast. And that's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's great. And I'm glad that I, I feel like I've been able to get to the point where now I can punch at, uh, at a level that is similar to some of the, the industry leaders with it, which I'm very happy about. So I beyond, think, oh no, go ahead, Andrew. Well, I, say, I think there's so much value to, you know, we, sometimes we want to do a thing and then we look at the world around us and, you know, be like, oh, I have a story I want to share. Like, oh, you should do a YouTube channel. It's like, Oh, I guess I'm a YouTuber now, you know, or, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to do a thing on, you know, I want to do a breakdown of this movie. Oh, you should do a podcast. Uh, I guess I'm a podcaster now. And there's something to the idea of saying, take these mediums and use them for the purpose that you want. Short form has been great. The fact that we now can do, you can do the, the three episode season or just do three of a thing and put it out there. Yeah. Make, use the mediums the way you want to. Don't feel, and I've, I've talked to people like, oh, you should blog. Oh, I don't want to be a blogger. Like, no, like you can get a WordPress site, put a post up, never do another thing again. It's yeah. there. Want to come back? You got it there. It doesn't mean every week you got to share. We get so focused on, because it was drilled into our heads, like, oh, you got to keep producing more and more. It's like, that's not my goal. My goal yeah. is, I want this thing out there. That's it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, beyond, the, beyond the technical side of it, Justin, um, how has scripting out now a second season of a show, has that influenced much of what you do with say politics or the other, or the other streams? Like d does, cause with, you know, with the, with raise the dead, right? Like you're going over the scripts, you've got them, I'm sure pretty, pretty tight between what you write and what you record. Um, how does, how does that influence the more free form uh, streaming and podcast side with politics? Um, with, well, politics has become a little bit more of a polished thing, but, but there I, I pretty much am just looking for either thoughts or stories. So I'm like, all right, I know I have the big story, the big thought, the big take, the big reaction up top. And then I got a secondary thing and then maybe a tertiary thing. And then a guest, right? So I've got that as like, I have the DNA of that and I'm looking for things to plug into it. For Raise the Dead, it was, especially season two, as I thought more about this as a repeatable format, um, the big thing that I realized, and this was in a conversation with Andrew about just like story in general, was like, what is the mantra for the show? What is the mantra for the episode? And so what I would do, in the first season, I rewrote my scripts over and 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 over again. And what I wound up getting by the end of it was a good essay and a bad episode, right? And so what I realized is that I had to go back and, and redo it. What I didn't realize at that point was exactly what I was doing. And so with this one, I actually came up with a fairly repeatable process that worked for me, which was write out just my garbage script. Like it's just going to be bad and I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on it. Uh, well, actually here, one step before that, I have a grid of nine boxes and I would write out what my story was like, just this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and 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 that's, that's the episode, right? From that grid, I'm then writing out my garbage script. Uh, uh, and every time that I'm like, eh, I don't know, just put it in. Uh, record that with uh, uh, as little, you know, kind of uh, dressing it up as possible. Like I didn't want to get into technical things immediately. So I didn't want to get too much into all the archive sound, too much into where every sound cue should come in. I just need to hear myself reading the bad script. And I would then go on a walk and drink beer. And I would use my superpower, which is, giving people notes that don't want to hear it. And normally it just makes my friends not want to talk to me, but now I can use it for fun and profit because if I'm listening to this thing that I know is bad and then I'm ripping it apart, I can ask myself the real question that matters. And this is where 
the 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 harvest is what is this episode about what is like now that i listen to it and i've got just a jumble of stuff what's the real story here and that was something i got from andrew andrew you know was was we were talking about writing and and his process and he was like you know everything becomes a lot easier once you know what the story is and obviously it's a little different with nonfiction than fiction because you need to fit the pieces you know that that actually kind of happen together but it's like only for me once i listen to myself read it and i get frustrated like i just knew in my i trust my instincts of being like why am i talking about this like i want more about this other thing that i was talking about like five minutes ago like that was interesting this is dumb and hmm. when I got to that point, I'm like, oh, well, this is a story about this person, or this is a story about this thing, or these things that I glossed by, I need to spend more time on. These things that I spent a ton of time on, I can pare down to a, a little bit. And I got, you know, there were huge parts of the show that got cut. Like uh, initially, I was going to make this a little bit more tied to the primary system. And I was going to use a lot of recordings that I made on the primary trail. And I was going to be like, look, here's how much I care about you and, and the connection between the past and the present. I was there for the present. And then every time I wrote in a thing about how I, I know this now better because I was there while I was listening to this, I'm like, who cares? Shut up. Nobody cares that you were there. Like, just use the audio and, like, don't be I'm Mr. On the Road guy because nobody gives a, a, a crap about it. And it made it better because it got down to what the real story of this was, the, the, the form and fit of it, and it got back to the characters. And that was really a, a huge part. But that, that process of, like, I, I needed to edit sound. I needed to basically get to a minimum viable product to edit sound because once I did that, it made writing the sound so much easier than trying to make it great on the page first. I, I'd like to add though that, you know, my, my process for writing books, fiction actually came from when I sat down to write my nonfiction book, remember years ago, how to make an action movie for $99. Of course. And yeah. And that was my first non-magic book. And I needed to write a book that was, how do you make, and I said, how do I, how do I, because you have all these different, when you're doing nonfiction, you have all these different directions you can go into. And finally I said, I guess I just need to use questions and answers and break, like, I, I, literally the title, how do you make an action movie for $99? And I'm like, that's the first question, you know, and what's the answer to that is, well, you got to budget this, da, 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 da. Well, how do I answer each what in this? How do I do this? And how do I do this? And how do I do that? And it becomes this tree that basically just an outline that unfolds in front of itself. And the same thing I would say for like, you know, how did the 19, you know, how did the 1964 election? What what decided this? And we've talked about like, you know, we actually played with using the AI at one point to see asking it questions yeah. about this. And it brought up some very interesting things that were were in what you're doing. And also yep. other things that were relevant, but not as relevant as the main story. And it showed you that like, yeah, there's a thousand different books that you could write on that. And you have to make a choice to say, from this frame of reference, from this point of view, this is how I want to address it. This is what goes in and this is what goes out, you yeah. know, and you know, it's hard, but that's, that's you as an artist. There was a book that was on a, uh, like a history of Silicon Valley. And I'm not, and, and, the person went out and they did interviews with a bunch of people in the business, tons of interviews. And they sat down to write the book and they didn't write the book. They ended up deciding to publish the interviews and they read the beginning and, and they're, the author's very defensive, like, well, actually a book like this is harder than a regular book because of da da da. I'm like, maybe, but it feels to me like you didn't know where to find your narrative. And so you yeah. decided to publish an oral history of this, which has value, but I ain't going to read it because a lot of these things are, you know, they're like, I started, ah, it's, I, I would rather, I would rather a more just, I want an experienced person like a Justin Robert Young going in there and telling me a narrative because otherwise it's, it's like every gangs of New York, the actual no. original. No, it is literally an almanac 
of the gangs of New York. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's what I that's what I had always heard. That, that, that it's a lot of like and by this point, there were like 88 sharks and 49 countrymen, and like, like, and then they all had these amount of potatoes and the following tins of tobacco. Yeah, the dead mouse and nail squad split up into the nails and the mice. You know, yeah. and <laughs> not, it, literally, it's this. It's this. There is. It is not a story. It is literally a like a, a the just. And this happened to this it's gang, history book. This gang. It's not even a history book. Yeah, yeah it's a Wikipedia yeah. page. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I yeah, think it's, it's, you know, oh, no, sorry, go ahead. no, you go. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, and that's, that's what I had to figure out. And what I think I'm, I'm proudest of is, is realizing like, no, this season, because it's shorter, I've got to pack a lot more, uh, personality into it. And, you know, it's three episodes largely because there's Kennedy Spoiler alert, his story goes some places. Uh, and and other people need to pick up the slack. And then Goldwater and then Johnson. But each of them have uh, their own narrative. And I think it's really compelling. And I think it uh, they all really, really tie into this world. But it's like, you have to do a fairly delicate, well, you have to be very, very sure of yourself with stuff like this. And it's like, you have to know, all right, I'm telling this story and maybe I get everything. And maybe like, like the, the, the guesses I'm making on motivations based on the, the history that surrounds it is perfect or not perfect. But the worth of this is let me tell a compelling story that brings this to life and then nails it back to our modern world. And to me, that's where the strength of my format is. And I think when I find frustrating and things that I'm not, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm less of a fan of, uh, it's when they don't. It's when, you know, there's a lot of putting yourself at the center or a lot of uh, uh, not just picking a lane and saying, here's our story. Boom, strap in, buckle up. By the time we get to the end, you're going to know why I started talking. And, and that's, that's what I want. I, 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 want uh, I wanted to bring that kind of self-confidence. But creatively, you can't get there unless you know where you're going. Like, you can't fake that. You can't, you can't fake that in any kind of story. You can't fake that in any kind of, of work. If you wanted to read as confident or sound as confident, then you got to... You got to know it, especially when people could read into your voice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, you talked about, um, I, I don't know, it, it was very interesting for me to hear you say, oh, yeah, the very first thing I do is I write a script and then I record it, which, yeah. to, which sounds, I mean, it's, it's a testament to your ability to, to go and listen to your own work um, with a critical eye that's that is very helpful advice that we give have given on this show a lot to anyone in any creative field like go and do a thing and it's gonna be bad and then watch it and be really harsh about it and it's very difficult to do that last a bit of like okay i'm listening to this as not just as the creator because if you listen as a creator you're going to be like oh yeah i love that i made that choice i love that i did all these things that i decided to do where um where I think that's the value in your saying this script is not even, I don't even care. I just need the words on a page right now and, and I'll go from yeah. there. Like it's kind of, it, it, it does feel a little um, taking the scenic route maybe. Right. But over time you're, you're going to have a better sense of writing those scripts when you're writing that first draft. Like this is something, this is a process that's going to shrink considerably over time as you figure this out. I feel like. Maybe, but, but maybe not because I, I do think that, look, the, the medium is the message and, and like, yeah, maybe I'll be better at guessing, right. Maybe I'll be better at, at knowing how it sounds and I'll just get better at writing, uh, radio scripts, uh, versus essay scripts or news stories or magazine features, which is, you know, what I have more experience in, but ultimately like, I don't know what's good until I hear myself talking about it. And once well, I hear myself, 
talking about it, I can find it so much. I mean, like it was night and day trying to like, it, I didn't even like the, my first drafts. I didn't send to anybody. Last time I sent my drafts to a bunch of people and I got a bunch of notes and I got a bunch of stuff that I changed and I moved and I flipped and I tried to, to tweak and stuff like that. Now I just, as soon as I, as soon as I can hear it, like, man, am I like, I am, uh, uh, I think I give good notes in general, but like, boy, is it annoying to listen to other people give you notes. Uh, and, and so like, I realized like, to be honest in this process, I was like, I discovered a superpower. Like my superpower is like, I can, I can take this ball and I can figure out, yep. Like, even if it's 20%, if I can find that 20%, I'm like, boom, there we go. Now I know exactly how to expand it from here. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the, the thing I, I really, I think we all believe in is that you, that the path to success is to make things and to learn things. Yeah. There are people I know who've made things for years and who are not any, maybe they're, they're, they're incrementally better. Like a rock gets smoothed down in a river better, but they're not, they, they could have got there in two years instead of 20 and where they would have been now would have been amazing. And most people, a lot of people like to make things but they don't want to learn from it because they don't want to open up the, the, to criticism. And I, I remember my phase of not wanting to be, criti be criticized for something. And I experienced that anew when I first started making app. When I went from writing books, then I got to the point, I can handle criticism because I know I'm good enough to fix it. When I started creating applications, I had to start all over and my skin got thinner. I watched my skin get thinner when I try something new. And that's the thing I have to realize, oh no, I had to become better as a person. I became better in this task and it's yeah. hard because as we expand, we have to learn how to do new things. So make a lot of things, learn from those things, and then improve that. And for me as a writer, when it comes to a book, my MVP, the thing that my minimum viable product is actually my outline. That is the thing where I can iterate. I can figure out what I need to do to make it better, to improve. I can find my weaknesses in my story. And then I can go write a book in a week or two. And that book will be if I go through the steps I need to do with my outline, any problem I have in the book started in the outline and it's evident in the outline. And I think that's the thing with a lot of stuff is to identify, you know, where that is. Pixar would, it was easy for them to write scripts and iterate scripts because you throw money at Joss Whedon or JJ Abrams or somebody else and have them do another polish and you got a script, but then that wasn't enough for them. Their MVP was storyboards is they would take that story. They'd put it into storyboards and they'd go take it to like six year olds and show them the storyboards of Toy Story or whatever movie they're working on. And that was the perfect audience because those kids didn't go, why are you showing me storyboards? What what's what what happened? They're like, they're looking at the characters, the characters are real in their head, but that's where they could figure out story problems. You know, kids would be like, well, what about this? Why is he so mean? Why is he so mean? And they go, okay, we gotta fix this. And they could iterate and go back on those storyboards and then go on to production before they spent a ton of money. We've seen some filmmakers like Lucas treated shooting on the prequels as the mvp you know that was he i can go bring everybody back in i haven't been here for years i got a year con years of contracts for everybody we'll go back in to fix it on a blue screen and it's like yeah but what if there are structural problems and that was yeah. part of the problem with the prequels and we saw in the sequels you know we saw uh their mvp was you know a month before it's going into theaters you know trying to fix stuff and you know, where Marvel, Marvel, com, Marvel has a really good approach where that script, that script is their MV, their script. They try to fix it in the script phase. They go through painful rewrites on stuff. You hear the point at which directors generally leave projects on a Marvel project is the script phase yeah. because they're not happy with where it's going. And that's when you see people, nope, I'm out of here. It's not what I signed. I'm like, great. We can get somebody else to do it. Yeah. Uh, and then they allow for reshoots on stuff because if, if something got missed along the way, so identify your MVP and where you can iterate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a huge, a huge thing. Although I will say this, uh, uh, I don't think I would be able to use my process in season one. The season two process yeah. would not have worked for me in season one because I didn't know, like as soon as I have the faith in myself that I can do it, that I have it in me, that I can make, I could make a season one quality thing again, and now I become obsessed with making it better. Then it's like, oh, okay. Well, now I know at the very least I can fish out a season one episode. 
-hmm. And now when I go forward, I know that I can fish out a season two episode and I, and, and I'll be able to, the more I do it over and over and over again, that'll be it. But I've, I've done it now with, with a few other things with a few other, like there was another project that we were working on that, uh, I was literally, it was with a bunch of people and it wasn't a recorded thing, but I was, or it wasn't a, a, a history thing. It was just a panel show. And I was like, let's all just talk. Let's all talk about a thing and then give me all the audio and I'll take my walk and I'll listen to it and I'll hate it. And I'll find out, I'll uh, direct my heat vision of what I hate and what I think sucks. And I will burn it all away and we will find, and then I'll be able to edit it into something that is good and I'll find the heart. And that's the key. The key is, uh, uh, unlike anything else that I've done, audio is very much a visceral, emotional, like, thing it, because it's personal like you just want every moment to be with the good and get away from the bad and the boring and it's like the more you can identify like okay a cool thing's happening a cool thing's around the corner like i identify with this person i i now can see myself in this in this situation or i want to be in this conversation that's where you 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 have to you have to do it and that was like to me that having that revelation was not only the best thing for raise the dead season two, it's, it's the best thing for my career in podcast. Well, I think that your point too, about how it changed from season one to two. And like, that was what I saw for me with my books is that the thing that the most important to me thing now at the phase I'm at right now is my mission statement. And that is this book, my characters are going to go through this and my audience is going to be experiencing this. So I have my internal and my external things this story has to have that. And if I have my mission statement and I have a clear mission statement, what it is, putting it into a outline is autopilot, even writing is autopilot in the best way. And that, that once I start to like, you know, chapter 22, I get to play the game and have fun working my way through what the beats I'm going to hit. And I'd say that like, that's the thing is you, as you start to sort of understand certain things, then you sort of change what that MVP needs to be. You know, Stephen King maybe doesn't need to sit down with an outline or anything to write a story. But it's funny, like, I'm halfway through The Outsider, and I'm at that point, or kind of later in, where I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the same point in, you know, It, and this is the same point in other stories where the group has to, they got spread apart, now they're back together, and they're going to go confront, you know, the, the thing. thing. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like, man, like, this... This is now very clearly a Stephen King story because I see the thing that happens in a lot of Stephen King stories because, you know, he can say, ah, I can apply this. Let me let me set up a space clown. It'll be a shapeshifter, you know. Yeah. And it, it but, speaks so. to your confidence to be able to to take that sort of methodology, Justin, of just like just put it out here and we'll find it in at, we'll find it after we excavate. Right. Especially with this other yeah. project you were talking about of just like. Let's just talk and get it, which is like uh, a, a very valid methodology. And it's also very counter to how a lot of people would like to work, right? A lot of people would love to have a script and say, okay, I need this kind of soundbite. And then I need this kind of quote. And then I need this kind of visual. And then I need this, you know, like even, even broadly speaking without specifics, there's some people who would go in and say, I need these kinds of things and know them very, um, uh, you know, know them very particular and, and not, I, I guess I said counter, maybe that's not quite right because uh, you can do both. Right. Um, well, I know, like, yeah. And I, I think the big difference is I don't want to edit sound on the page in the same way that like, uh, 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 you know, you have to work in the medium for which people are going to listen to it. And for me, like I, I can, write a better script once I hear a bad version of it. Once I hear a bad version of it, now I get the ability to write a script that is, so the scripts that I have are almost word for word. Like they are, they are like, I don't do a ton of maybe rhetorically I'll, I'll go on little flourishes, but the, the scripts that I, the final scripts that I have are almost exactly the transcripts of the episodes, but I can only write that once I, I work in the world of, of, of audio, because that's, uh, to me, that was, that was the turning point was realizing that like, Oh, this isn't, 
like even for the panel show, once I realized, okay, here's the heart of the show. Here's what we want to do. I could go back to everybody and be like, hey, this is the point. The, the show is at its best when we're doing this. So as we're going about it, we don't need to say it out loud, but keep doing that. And the stuff that isn't that, just know is getting cut. <laughs> so to, <laughs> like, like just know that going forward. Yeah. Um, there is, there, oh, there's, I, there's a lot. Uh -huh. Go ahead. <laughs> it's the, sorry. sorry. It's, it's for those of you who don't know, like delay in Skype and any communications gets so bad. It's why people talk over each other. We're not rude. We're just, yeah. Price. Oh, okay. Uh, so the, the, the reason I kind of brought up this other sort of me methodology is because I, I think about like, uh, when we do some of the product videos for like scam stuff, um, you know, especially like specifically the mystery boxes, which are like kind of our bigger things. We only do them, you know, once a year or so. And I always have, I always, my process has always been some function of both of those components, which is like, yeah. it's me in an empty dark room trying to figure out what I want to do with this thing. And over the years, the thing that I have brought into that process is, okay, here are the types of shots that I would like to see. I, you know, I need yes. to see close ups of because I know what the box looks like a little bit. So I need to see the dials. I need to see this. What if I did this? And, and so I, I don't know, once you get into the very specific parts of it of like, okay, I need this number of different close up shots. I need this many wider shots. I need, you know, these various focal points. Then that kind of frees you up in the moment when you're in there doing the excavating basically to look at it from another layer up of another layer up closer to self actualization, I guess, uh, for lack of a better way of like, oh, okay, 100%. what is this? As what is this aesthetically? What is this message wise? What are we trying to say on a next level up beyond the detail, you know, specific concrete points? And let me say this, uh, the difference between audio and video is that audio is cheap. Mm -hmm. And I can like I can way easier than you can relight, repost, have talent, like even if it's just product videos, right? Like resetting up exactly everything and making sure that your camera and everything is, is set up. I can go back and re-record a lot cheaper and easier and less painful than that. Like if I re-record two full versions of that script, like at the end of the day, what's it's a it's you know, maybe an extra 45 minutes. And so yeah, wow. what, what I kind of realized was let's exploit that. Let's exploit the fact that it's like, if I just have to read this script three times, but I get the best version of this episode, like, uh, then that's awesome in a way that you, that video does not allow for like right. a video. You got to get every possible thing you need to go into battle. Your minimum viable product is really just even your list of shots that you need to get and your skill to be able to get them because then you got to fit stuff together in a, in a way that like for, for audio, I can just re-record and re-record and re-record and re-record and re-record, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, 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 in such a cheap way. How, um, how tough on yourself have you been with, uh, in terms of like a deadline, because like for a lot of the stuff that we do, like you know we do scam nation and stuff, and we uh, we try to pack in our shoot days or with Modern Rogue, where you know we're trying to get we kind of you know we need to get in and we need to get out because we we got to yeah. do other things, and that means that you end up m developing a sense quicker on set of these are the types of things that are going to work. These are not the things that are going to work. We need to stop. We need to adjust. We need to make sure we go back and get this stuff while we're on set. Because like you mentioned, like it's, it's not great to try to go and it's, it, there's a lot of overhead in redoing stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that sense develops from doing a lot of stuff in a short, from a, a higher density sort of turnaround on that stuff where I know these are a little looser. You can kind of set your own deadline. How challenging have you been with yourself on that? Because I think developing those intuitions come with saying like, even if it's not every week, but if it's just like, I'm giving myself a real hard date on this, publish the date now. Cause it's going to be a hard date. Yeah. I, I, I've, Besides just knowing that I had to launch this in October because that was when people care about politics and blah, blah, blah. Like in terms of the micro uh, stuff, like I just knew I needed uh, Saturday was my production day. 
and I, I knew, all right, this episode gets to this point this day. Like this is, this is what I'm doing. This is when I'm listening to it. I just know that I'll be able to maybe do a little tweaks throughout the week, but uh, uh, this is when it gets, this is when it gets cranked out. So really I was focused more this season on the process, knowing that I had time until uh, uh, October. Although that being said, I'm literally looking at all the things I still need to do and and I have uh, not done it as it launches on Sunday. But, um, but yeah, I, I think there is uh, deadlines become a lot easier and more manageable when you have a process. And the more you have a process that you trust, the more you are able to dial that up or or you know slow that down to make sure that everything works. I mean, like that in terms of sanity and and uh, knowing when to press, when to when to take your foot off the gas, everything becomes clearer when you when you know and trust your process. Hmm. Yeah. You guys want to do picks? Yes. Hmm. Uh, my pick is. Uh, I'm trying to think of which of the HBO shows last night. I, I, the vow was better. The vow was better than it normally is. That they, they, they kind of, uh, it's a meandering way. To, no, you want to know what? It's not the vow. It's Lovecraft Country. <laughs> uh, they, they, they told a sci-fi story, and uh, uh, I, you know, it's a very inventive uh, and and expansive show, and uh, uh, it was a visual treat, and it was nice to get a little bit outside of the. Uh, the 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 blood and guts that has uh, uh, defined the show. I'll say um, I'm of two minds of this most recent episode of Lovecraft Country because uh, I don't know. It's such a weird thing. The balance that they're having to figure out a balance between the long arc of we need to figure out our relationship with magic and this this occult club whatever the, 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 the harry potter of it all yeah like they need to balance out how much time they spent with that and these like kind of episode of the week sort of arcs and so it was really great to see this character who doesn't really get a lot of screen time to begin with have like a whole thing that goes like a lot of places that was cool but also like half of this yeah. episode is not it could, about it could, that. it could really go to all five slaughterhouses <laughs> But but that's only like half of the episode where like, you know, last week's episode, which was really nice. The one in in Korea, like that is mostly not about the Harry Potter of it all. Um, and so I, I think the show is just having a weird time figuring out a good balance um, on those two fronts because I thought it was great. I would have loved. I needed, I feel like I needed one more layer on that episode of the week story to really feel like, okay, this is like a whole, this is get enough time to flourish on its own. I, I agree. I, I would have liked a little bit more to at least touch back from the episode last week to, to bind it a little bit more. Um, but, uh, uh, for this one, it's like, I think the one thing that I would agree with you on is that the story is overripe for us to not know exactly where we're chasing. Like right now, narratively, all the characters are like, well, we're kind of just looking for an answer. Mm -hmm. As soon as we find that answer, boy, is there going to be a race to the end. You hit the books sides. and I'm going to hit the books and we'll be back in yeah, 20 like, minutes. We know, that there's sides, we know that there's double agents. We know where all the like tendrils are. And now we just need to know where the Ark of the Covenant is so everybody can start running to it. Yeah. We need to know what the consequences of, of doing that are and. Let's go. And I hope we get there next episode. But in the meantime, there was a very pretty episode that happened last night. Yeah. And like very imaginative. Uh, a lot of like unexplained things that will probably never get explained, I bet. And that was yeah. pretty cool. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a pick. This is, um, I don't, this is a little show. I don't know if you've heard of this, you know, um, but I've been watching it. Uh, this has been like my background show. Just throw yeah. it on. It's the thing that I can listen to while I'm working on something, playing something, relaxing. It is uh, uh, The Simpsons, which is on uh, Disney Plus. 
Um, Simpsons, eh? <laughs> I have been going back. At first, I had gone back to like just throw me in the middle of those early seasons and I'll just start watching. And then uh, like this past week, I had made a concerted effort to like, okay, let's go start from the beginning and do all this stuff. And uh, you really see, especially in the first few seasons, like how much it's trying to find its footing, how much stuff in terms of formatting, in terms of animation and rendering, like what this show looks like, what these characters are like. Um, you know, like, and you notice how, how some, some stuff that seemed probably maybe a couple of clicks higher than vestigial ended up disappearing completely from the show. Right. You know, Nelson used to have those two little goblin guys who just hung out with him all the time. And like a lot, they're not around anymore. I don't believe like weird things of, you know, the news anchor, who was there before Kent Brockman was the news guy, you know, like yeah. really the way that they even view uh, Springfield in, in, in terms of like, what is this town actually look like? And nowadays it's kind of very quaint and suburban where like in some of these early ones, it's, it's kind of urban and it's kind of got, you know, a gritty kind of nasty side to it. And uh, have you seen the Tracy Ullman shorts? I have not. I, I think it'd be worth uh, since you've since you've done the back uh, uh, the back watch like yeah. they're a lot more avant garde, mm. and and I think that that's really where the show sort of found its footing is like no this isn't an art film this is like this meditation on suburbia and life and family, uh, uh, but they have the ability to go to all these crazy places and tell this kind of ribald humor. But uh, uh, the the evolution from that, and then really it's like, all right, if you're in a short, then it's like, okay, this bizarre, almost sinister funhouse mirror version of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the honeymooners or something like that, or some sort of family scenario, that's a cool short idea. Like, but it, I don't know how long you want to stay there. Yeah. Like, uh, you need to kind of fall in love with everybody to want to come back week after week after week after week. And I think that's what they realized more than anything else. Yeah. It's interesting because like, I remember a kid watching Tracy Ullman show and in the interstitials with the Simpsons and they were great. I'm like, Oh, this is funny and great. And they're like, Oh, they're getting their series. Now as an adult, I understand, actually I know one of the direct David Silverman. Now. I've got the pleasure of meeting one of the directors, you know, who worked on this and helped show, steer that show is going from Matt Groening's, you know, comic panel sensibility to like, oh, let's make an actual cartoon that's on the Tracy Ullman show to the, the popularity of that. Like people don't remember the Tracy Ullman show, but everybody knows The Simpsons. Yeah. And then watching them there has been nothing like that. Cartoons, primetime cartoons, if they had been around, were were you know like Flintstones retreads of the Honeymooners or were takes on other stuff that you know had their own charm to it. But how do you how do you make a smart cartoon that adults will watch in the late '80s, early '90s, and watching them evolve this into an institution like South Park, you know, has lasted you know even longer than that has lasted this incredible period of time has defined everything else that came after it. Everything after it, you know, that's that's the that's that sort of like for primetime animation, in animation generally you have Walt Disney, in primetime animation you've got The Simpsons and it shaped everything there. And it is fascinating to see now like this guy plus this person, you put these people together, like you take, you know, uh you look at Rick and Morty, you get Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, and you get Rick and Mor you get Rick and Morty. You take Justin Roiland and uh, uh, was it uh, Mike Michael McCann. McMahon, yeah, and you get Solar Opposites. You take Mike McMahon by himself or the couple other people who names I can't think of right now, and you get Star Trek Lower Decks. Mm -hmm. And like, like I love Lower Decks way more than Solar Opposites, right? Really, but mm. I. Oh yeah, I I yeah, absolutely. Um I can't uh there's to me there's this I love Royland, but Royland is this guy that when Royland goes off into Royland, like the characters become so unbound and sociopathic. I don't know <laughs> I don't I lose my sense of like what's I mean, important like, here. Roy Royland Royland is basically like his instincts are really on display in those 
in those uh, uh, interdimensional cable episodes, and you just kind of realize that like every every character is just like, <laughs> like, hey, I'm a guy. I'm a guy. I ripped my face off. Oops. Where's my face? I'm going to use it as a dinner table now. Ooh, I'm eating. Yeah. yeah and if you go like, back on one hand, that's, that's the creative element of it, but it's like, there's not quite the humanity that I think when he works with, with the co-collaborators, uh, you get that expansive creativity with a little bit more of the grounding. I, he's, he's a genius. So let me make that clear, but he's a person that like, yes. yeah. And it's like, it's like Walt without Roy. You know, and and it often it's and sometimes different people can play it. You know, Matt without Trey. You know, those guys together, and where you see where the direction they pull into is fast. And The Simpsons is an example of graining plus some other brilliant people going, "What is this?" And mm -hmm. then, and also, I don't know if you think about animators, which I'm sure you do. Like, they got the darkest sense of humor of anybody in the entertainment industry. Very weird. Yeah. Very yeah, weird. Left left to their own devices it's just yeah. just if, if they could do anything it'd be terrified and i mean in in some ways like you look at those early those early first like three years or so of the simpsons show and like it's really dark and it gets like really heavy i mean lots of like hey seriously the family is homer and marge will divorce because they're like relationship like you look at i don't know i feel like the simpsons today and uh, uh, the simpsons the last time i looked at it which was probably years ago feels like it's a there's a bubble over it right like they've got a format you do a non sequitur and then that leads to the real story and then whoop, all, everything's all wrapped yep. up together at the end and you look at like, nah, they could have like really gone off the rails on any one of these episodes. And it's, it's just, I, it's a, it's such a strong punch, you know, it makes, that's kind of why we remember, uh, what is it? The, the Bart one where he fails and he's, he's crying in front of the teacher and, and at the last second he gets a point or whatever. Like, like that stuff just like really resonates because it feels so raw and I, real. Yeah. And I would say that. They hit their stride like a few years after that. Okay. And then the, I think the people who kind of a lot of it now is like, you know, there are a lot of the original people still involved, but like Simpsons became its own genre, which is sort of, I think, kind of a trap because once you become your own genre, you don't see outside of it. And I remember years ago, like like 15 years ago, you know, a con hearing a conversation with one of the writers is like, well, the problem is we've run out of things for Homer to do. And I'm like, I'm like, your problem is, you think that's what the show was about is what crazy thing did Homer do now? And I'm like, that's and I didn't say this. I just thought this to myself loudly. <laughs> I'm like, that's the problem is the show was its most imaginative. The the most memorable characters all came out in the first six or seven years, you know, Ned Flanders, yeah. Nelson, all of this, like, and I tell him like, name a character that came out in the last 10 years, name, name an interesting character. And I don't, maybe there are, but I'm like, that's to me, that's, that's sort of the symptom of the show is that, all the it's not like oh we created all the cool characters no you didn't uh you just sort of became your own genre and you thought well it's a show and then well nelson will do this and this personality will do this which happens to ever to to a lot of shows that have a sizable cast right is like we can't maybe there's someone saying well we can't just keep making new people so keep finding new configurations of people i mean but i'll tell you what that's that's really the legacy of south park though right as like you know they were how many seasons deep and they come up with pc principal and the pc babies and like all these other characters that are kind of new and had never really been seen before that are mm -hmm. defining of the modern era of it and uh you know speaking of of the idea of uh uh, these things becoming normal. I don't know if you guys saw this, but because obviously we live in a, a COVID world, uh, there are no people at many sporting events. Colorado is no different. And so for the Denver home game, a portion of the crowd were all South Park cutouts. And it they were all <laughs> different characters from South Park. And it's like, wow. to come from where that started and one of their first big, like long-term payoff, like who shot JR episodes was that Cartman's dad was the 19, was all of the 1997 Denver Broncos who had all had sex with Cartman's mom. Now the actual franchise, like <laughs> celebrating them as this iconic, uh, uh, you know, Colorado centric entertainment by doing this big thing at a football game is just mind blowing to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing the legacy, but yeah, to Bryce, 
the advantage of animation is you can go to Hank Azaria and say, hey, what other voice do you have? Yeah. And, yeah, that's true. Oh, I got another one. And so that was, you know, as we retire certain voices because, you know, our, sens- you know, our, our sensibilities have changed over time and the way we want to characterize certain groups and stuff. It's an opportunity to create new stuff. And I'd say, like, South Park is like, like, Butters feels like he's been around forever and probably by cartoon years he has, but Butters is. He was, know, a was a later edition. Than, yeah. Yeah. PC principal, like, it was like very much in the zeitgeist. And I would say that they've done really good jobs of like, oh, let's go do this thing. And so, you know, yeah, I think anyhow, so yeah, uh, the, the Simpsons on, and they fixed it on Disney plus. If you re- remember the new story oh, from the back then ratios are the same. I need to see all the pipes for the beer factory. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have a pick Andrew? Uh, my pick is going to be, I don't know if you guys have downloaded iOS 14, but, um, there is have you seen the new thing for the voice memo no voice memos now has an automatic cleanup so or move background noise and stuff and make your voice sound clear oh Oh, that's cool that's Um, that's interesting what is it using oh you didn't record let me do it i'll do a demo here let me try this yeah i'm recording my voice right now and i'm going to play it for you so we'll see if it's staticky Let's see. I'm recording my voice right now, and I'm going to play it for you, so we'll see if it's staticky. Okay, that's without any correction. Okay, I don't think you can hear any difference there. And we're yeah, today so we're doing Skype, do the so the audio fidelity may be a little different today. You guys can be my witnesses, and you can tell me if you hear. I'm recording my voice right now, and I'm going to play it for you, so we'll see if it's staticky. Don't know if you can tell the difference, but I hear automatically all the background stuff is is gone. The voice is crisper and clearer, so I could definitely feel more uh, compression on on the voice. You could feel it; it sounded a little punchier just from that bit that we could make yeah. through. Yeah, the good kind of compression, folks. But yeah, yeah. So uh, just a thing to note. Like I haven't tried anything else, but I think if somebody's looking at doing, if you want to do podcasts or you want to do stuff and you're very worried about it, there's nothing like sitting down to record something and you hear <sighs> stuff in the background and you're like, yeah. Oh, now I get why people have microphones and amplifiers and all this other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can't. But here, I think you can get you can get great quality audio out of this. Probably better than what we're doing on Skype. Nice. Almost cer- almost certainly we could do better than Skype. But yeah. uh, uh, yeah. making lemonade. Uh, that's really cool. I did not know about that. Voice memos always seems like a real... Like, we use voice memos occasionally on set if we, like... We, if we like didn't have enough mic packs for somebody, we could just pull out a phone. We had a lav mic for the iPhone and you could just plug it in and start a voice memo and just record that. Um, that's... I'm not going to name, I'm not going to name names, but I've worked on broadcast shows. We're like, we need you to get a couple lines. Oh, want me to hop in a sound booth? No, just record it on voice memos and send it to us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a good, there's a great YouTube series, uh, that I watched and you could tell that almost all of the audio was recorded on phones because everyone would have their iPhone in their uh, breast pocket upside down so that the mic would be facing right up and hitting like you could tell every character, every character had their phone like this just, and it (laughs) it, it worked. It it worked because you kind of didn't really care about it that much, but it's yeah, these, these microphones are pretty good and they've got like apps like anchor and stuff that, will do uh, similar stuff. Like your phone has a good mic on it for some uses. Yeah. There's a new, I was just looking through the app store and there's a new one that I saw, like they actually have the featured thing on, on the, the Mac app store is podcast to go and podcast studio, which they're showing, which is the thing where people can get an app. People can download an app to record. And then this allows you to edit. There's other apps that do this, but this seems like it might be a straightforward, easy to use thing. So the tech is getting better. I mean, it's just, it's 10 years behind where we thought it would be when we started podcasting. Yeah. That's really, so, yeah. that's really cool. iOS is a voice memo with an enhancement feature. It's been after. Hey, good stuff, everybody. All right. We are going to, uh, uh, to stop off the stream. Uh, Court Killer's coming up in a couple of hours with Tom Merritt, Ayaz Akhtar, and Lamar Wilson. All sorts yeah. of good stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, oh. uh, my computer is about to catch fire. So I'm trying to pull up some music <laughs> and it's 
not having a very fun time with that. Um, I'm going to go to my other job now. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be back uh, in a little bit. Um, Okay, I'm just going to shut it down. Okay, bye. Bye, 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 bye